I was enjoying my perfect Friday night watching my favorite YouTuber's latest video when it got interrupted by a phone call. Tessa, the cops arrested me! Dress as my mom and come bail me out! That was Katie, my annoying cousin. She's the biggest troublemaker I know, which is why my aunt sent her to live at my house, in hopes that we could help change her attitude. Poof! So now, I have to sneak into mom's closet and borrow some of her clothes. Hmm. How do I apply makeup to look older? Ugh. That'll have to do. So, officer, what trouble is she in this time? She vandalized a car. Not me, mom! Blame the dumb car that got in my way! Jeez. If I were really Katie's mom, I would let her rot in jail until she came to her senses. I was about to lead Katie out of there when a boy grinned at me and said, Madam, can you bail me out too? Sorry, but no. You're not my problem. Okay, well, then can you at least give me your number? I spotted Katie frown at him, then she pulled on my arm. Let's go home, Mom. Katie, can't you grow up? I can't cover for you forever. You'll do it, else I may just accidentally slip out your little secrets to your parents. Ugh, that threat sure is getting old. Okay, so I didn't bail out Katie out of choice. You see, she has something over me. The thing is, I have a passion for baking, but my parents think this is a waste of time. I knew they'd never knowingly pay for my cooking classes, so I told them I needed money to join an extra study class. I know it sounds bad, but I did apply to work at a coffee shop bakery so I could pay them back while also gaining experience. But then Katie discovered my secret, and now she's using it to control me. <sighs> then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I arrived home to find my parents waiting up for me in the living room. Tessa, you were out partying, weren't you? Why do you keep on disobeying us? And is that my dress? Why can't you be more like Katie? She's really improved her grades. I turned around to see that Katie was nowhere to be seen. She must have quickly escaped through the back door to her room. What a minx. But my parents still believed she's the golden girl. Poof. It's rubbish, of course. The good grades she brought home were all by cheating. If it weren't for Katie knowing my secret, I so would have exposed her by now. Actually, besides Katie, there's also Celia, my best friend, who also knows about this. She may be a hothead, but when it comes to my secrets, I know her lips are sealed. Hey, Tessa, you have to see this. Celia waved her phone in my face. Hang on, that was BitKit Bakes, my all-time fave YouTube channel. I'd been following this guy for ages. He was so talented. Oh, and he always wore this cute kitty mask. Look at his hands. They're so beautiful. And how I adore his warm voice. I bet he's really handsome too. Celia is so smitten with boys. Ugh, it's Katie again. She's left her lipstick in the canteen and I've got to fetch it for her and take it to some cafe in town. This is ridiculous. I'm sure she could survive without her stupid lipstick for one afternoon. I walked into the cafe and spotted Katie sitting with two boys. Hmm, wasn't that the boy from the cop station? Turns out he's called Max, and he's Katie's new boyfriend. And the other guy is Cody. Both of them are college students. Hey Tessa, you should stay for cake. Seeing as I was here, I may as well have something sweet, right? So... I ignored Katie's eye rolls in my direction and joined them. The waiter brought some chocolate fudge cake over and... Yum, it sure looked good. I took a forkful of it and... Hmm, something wasn't quite right. This cake could use some salted caramel. Poof, a cake needs to keep its original flavor. If you add that to it, it'll be far too sweet. Oh, how rude. I was only voicing my opinion. Right at that moment, Celia phoned me. I just answered when she started screaming so loudly and I had to hold my phone away from my ear. Tessa, Tessa, Tessa! Celia, is everything okay? I know how to impress the Big Kid Bakes guy. We must make him a DIY gift. A chocolate resin phone case. What do you think? Am I a genius or what? 
I noticed Max, Cody, and Katie all giving me strange looks. Jeez, this was so embarrassing. So I quickly hung up on Celia, then made my excuse to leave. Ugh. I liked it better when only I knew about Bitkit Bakes. I watch his videos every day and daydream about baking with him. But now Celia's obsession over him was kind of tiring me out. She texted me nonstop to ramble about him and dragged me into her silly fan projects. She even joined this online fan club of his, and they all talked about how fit he looks, how handsome he must be. Hello, does anyone here really care about cooking? At least work meant I had a break from Celia's mithering. Ugh, what was he doing here? He bought two cups of coffee, then asked to borrow my phone because his was out of battery. I reluctantly handed over my precious phone, but then I heard a ringtone. Max excitedly took his ringing phone out of his pocket and said, So now I have your phone number, cute girl. What? The cheek of him! I'm his girlfriend's cousin! Has he no shame? I gave him a dumbfounded look, but he just smiled, handed back my phone, and winked at me. I saved my number in your phone! Give me a call! Then he left. He'd just reached the door when I snapped out of my daze. The phone case. Our chocolate phone case! Why did he have it? It's one of a kind, and we've already sent it to Bitkit Bakes. Didn't we? I was about to run after him to clear this up when Katie appeared. Max, why did it take you so long to buy coffee? Then she stormed over to the counter as soon as she spotted me. Stay away from my boyfriend, or your secret goes parent public, okay? Katie glared at me and dragged Max away. Even though they were leaving, I could still hear her voice. Don't talk to that girl. I don't like her. Huh? What on earth? Who wants her boyfriend anyway? How irritating. One evening, I was lying on the couch and thinking about whether Max could really be Bitkit Bakes when Celia excitedly ran over. I have our mysterious idol's phone number. Oh no, here we go again. Celia was way too excitable sometimes. So, a secret source that's in the fandom sent it to me. I wonder if this is his real number. You really believe that's Bitkit's number? Let's just give it a try. We have nothing to lose. It would be a lie to say I wasn't any tiny bit curious. So, I entered the phone number, and as soon as I pressed the call, Max's name appeared on the screen. Huh? What's this? I quickly hung up and turned to tell Celia that it was just a fake number. If Max is really our idol, then I don't want Celia getting muddled up with my crazy cousin's love life. Celia just shrugged and said, It's okay, I'll find another way. Then she did that sticking tongue out concentration face of hers as she fiddled around on her phone. The next day, I got home from my shift feeling a little worn out, but Celia still wouldn't give me a break. She came right over and dragged me out somewhere. Where are we going? I asked, but Celia just kept silent. Then we stopped in front of a small white house. At that point, Celia said, My source says this is Bitkit Bake's home. We're about to meet the most amazing guy ever. Before I could react, Celia ran to ring the doorbell. And as soon as the door opened, standing in front of us were Max and Katie. Tessa. Why are you here? You know him? Uh, um, this is Max, Katie's boyfriend. We were on our way to a friend's party, but it seems like we have the wrong house. Sorry for bothering you. Then I hurriedly pulled Celia's hand to leave, but Max stopped us. Oh yeah? Then you must have come to the right house. We're having a party, so join us. I quickly waved my hand to refuse, but Celia immediately said, that would be great! And then ignoring Katie's death stares, pulled me inside. Hmm, so turns out Max lives here with Cody and this guy called Trevor. I'll find out which of these three boys is our idol. Wait for it. Celia made up some excuse about loving their decor and wanting to see the rest of it for inspiration. Trevor, who seemed to like her, jumped at the opportunity to show her around. Meanwhile, I wandered into the kitchen to try and solve the Bit Kit Bakes mystery myself. Max was in there making himself an egg sandwich, but oh my god, 
Had he never touched a whisk before? He's so clumsy. I don't think there would be much of the egg left in the bowl after he's done whisking. The kitchen counter was full of food for the party, so I decided to give them a hand. Hmm, let's see. I spotted a bowl of cookie mixture, which looked like it could use some special ingredient, so I reached for the jar of sugar. And as expected, a hand stopped me. But Cody? What are you doing? You use brown sugar for cookies, not white. You don't want to end up with a load of air pockets, do you? Yes, of course I knew that. And I also knew BitKid had once said those exact words in one of his previous clips. So, the anonymous idol is... Cody? But Max's phone case was the one we sent to our idol. And the idol's phone number that Celia found was also Max's. This was so confusing, and I needed answers. So I asked Max to go outside with me. You aren't BitKid Bakes, right? Why do you have that phone case? Oh, so you figured it out! Yeah, I know you sent it to Cody, so I intercepted it. I'm also the anonymous fan who gave Celia this address. It's fate, baby. You and me are meant to be together. Then he lunged towards me with outstretched arms. Oh my god, did he have tentacle arms or something? I couldn't escape from his grip! Then who should appear but, yep, Katie. She charged over, then pushed me, falling to the ground. Cody appeared and tried to stop the fight, but Katie's flailing arms knocked into him and caused his wrist to brush against the hot barbecue grill. I quickly went to check on Cody, but Katie just screamed out, I hate you! Then ran off with a shameless Max in hot pursuit. We then went to Cody's room to get the first aid box. Hang on, I recognize that mask. Don't worry, I'll keep your secret. But maybe this arm shouldn't be on screen for a while. Celia has like the best detective sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a cute girl like you should wear the cat mask for the next few videos. What do you think? Are you sure? Your fans might speculate that the girl would have some kind of special relationship with you. Gosh, what am I saying? Wake up, Tessa. I should go. Right. There's something important waiting for me to handle at home. What a messy day. I couldn't carry on being under Katie's control any longer. I needed to confess all to my parents before she told them. Only, when I walked through the door, I heard these weird sounds coming from the living room. It was Katie bawling her eyes out on the couch. I ignored her and was about to go upstairs, but suddenly, she ran over to me and hugged me. Tessa, I'm so sorry for pushing you. I never meant for anyone to get hurt. I just really love Max, and it breaks my heart knowing he's such a womanizer. It's okay, but you seriously deserve way better than that jerk. So Katie and I made up, and she also promised that she wouldn't blab my secret to my parents. But I want to tell them the truth. I mean, I can't lie to them forever, right? And when they see how much baking means to me, they'll support me, right? Hey guys, so I entered a baking contest and invited my parents along. And guess what? I won the best newcomer prize! Eek! Better still, my parents congratulated me and told me that if I loved baking this much, I should follow my dreams. Oh, and I did use the prize money from the contest to pay them back. Cody's been a massive help. He's given me some great tips and, actually, we've started dating. It's early days, but being with him makes me feel as happy as eating freshly made cookies. And as for Celia, well, she's still pretty convinced that Trevor's her idol. <laughs> One day I'll introduce her to the real BitKid Bakes. Soon. Hello, it's me, Jenny, the maid in disguise. If you're wondering why a rich girl like me chose to be a maid, then it sounds like you haven't watched the dramatic episode one all about my turbulent time in this house. You should totally go and check it out. I had my dream acting role to get, so what better way to understand the mindset of a maid than to live the life of one? So that's why I'm here, working at the director Lucas's house. Unfortunately, it wasn't all smooth sailing, as his spiteful daughter Lily found out my secret, and now she was intent on making my life a misery. Jessie, Miss Hemingworth is asking for her tea. You see, I was already having a thousand things to take care of 
since tonight the director's throwing a party for the movie's crew. And still, Lily wouldn't give me a break with all of her annoying orders. As soon as I put the tea tray down in front of Lily, she looked at me disapprovingly, then took the dish towel from the tray and wiped the lipstick off my lips. Maids have no use for makeup, do they, Jessie? Or should I say, Jenny? Are you trying to seduce my Jack? Stay away from him, else I'll make you pay for it. I leaned close to Lily's ear. Hate to break it to you, but Jack's the one who can't seem to stay away from me. Apparently, you aren't as attractive as a maid, huh? Furious, Lily knocked over the teacup, causing a few drops of hot water to splash onto my hand. Right at that moment, Jack passed by and rushed over to me. Are you okay? Let me look at that. I'm fine. Please go away. I don't want my mistress to misunderstand. Jack helped me up, then turned and gave Lily an opposing look. I... I didn't do anything. She's just faking it. Without letting her finish, he led me into his room. Gee, Lily sure looked mad about this. <laughs> I honestly wasn't that hurt, but Jack still gently took care of me. He even softly blew on my hand to help relieve the pain. Can't deny that I was a little moved by his gestures. Mm. To be fair, he is handsome. It isn't a stretch that people call him the Adonis of showbiz. Suddenly, I noticed him meet my gaze. Oh no, had he noticed me staring at him? Why are you looking at me in that way? You're not even blinking. Then he leaned towards my face. Was he going to kiss me again? I quickly covered my mouth with my hand, and he just shook his head and laughed. What do you think I'm gonna do, huh? I leaped up and raced out of there. Whoa, my heart has never pounded so fast. <sighs> I composed myself, then went downstairs to continue working. But, well, well, look who's here again. Surely Lily started to boss me around anew as soon as she saw my face. The night fell, the guests started to arrive, and so the party could finally get started. And while serving everyone drinks, I kept my ear open to catch all kinds of gossiping about the play. Meanwhile, Lily was practically glued to Jack's side. She clearly wanted everyone to think that they were an item. She waved me over, but as I neared her, I noticed her stick her foot out to trip me up. Okay, fine. If she wanted me to fall, then I'd fall. So I purposely fell and spilled red wine all over her beloved bespoke dress. She looked like she was going to internally explode, but I just apologized profusely as I helped her up. Lily got the hump, then went upstairs to change clothes. With her out of the way, Jack asked me if my hand was okay. Was he really worried about me? He gently held my hand to check, then even dusted off my clothes. I gave a shy smile and was about to thank him, but he had already turned away to greet Siren, this beautiful emerging actress. Unbelievable! As I watched him lead her over to the dance floor, I felt so foolish for ever believing a guy like him was capable of having sincere feelings. I angrily left when the housekeeper insisted I fetch more chairs for the guests. Ugh, being a maid is really miserable. You don't even have time to be upset. As I hurried to the storage room, I saw Lily standing in front of the director's study room, looking sneaky. What was she doing? I cleared my throat, which startled her and caused her to drop her phone. Oh boy, when she spun around and saw me, she sure looked mad. She ordered me to carry her dress, but I told her that I had to finish the housekeeper's task first. Be quick, meet me by the pool. Then she stormed off. Curious, I peeked through the gap into Lucas's office and saw Mrs. Sharma in there with him. Was Lily eavesdropping on them? After that, I had to carry the train of Lily's dress around the party. Indeed, a showy girl. But her plan to punish me wasn't working, as everyone seemed to pay more attention to me than to her. I even overheard some of them whisper that I was pretty, which made Lily screw her face up in annoyance. Then when we were by the pool, she ordered me to fix her hair, but then she suddenly swung her hands out, which caused me to lose my balance. Panicked, I grabbed onto Lily's dress belt, 
and we both gave horrified looks as we fell head first into the pool. Lily intentionally pushed me for everyone to laugh at anyway, so fine, an eye for an eye. Seeing as Lily was like a buoyancy aid in that OTT dress, I pretended that I couldn't swim and clung to her, then pushed her head down several times. Suddenly, someone jumped into the pool and pulled me up. It was Jack. Hmm, for someone who can't swim, you sure don't seem that freaked out, huh? Next time, try acting more realistic. Jeez, Jack saw right through me. I shyly made an excuse to go change clothes and left. Thank goodness, that chaotic party was over. It was absolutely exhausting. Still, I couldn't stop thinking about Jack and how he always seemed to appear at the right moment. I suppose his actions really touched me. However, there's a chance that he was just using me to annoy Lily, right? She definitely wouldn't let me off this time. Speak of the devil. I forbid you from talking to Jack ever again. You've probably forgotten my warning. My dad's at home right now. Should I go talk to him? Do what you want, but I'm sure the press would love to see some unflattering photos of you. And do you remember how that one time you pretended to be sick in order to avoid participating in a charity program? You dare to sneakily take photos of me? You, you, it's you who went through my stuff first. I have no interest in Jack, but no way will I ever sit back and let you control me again. Okay, fine. As long as you don't hover around him, I'll leave you alone. Ah, my dad told you to bring him some tea into his working room, so better hurry up. Lucas wants to drink tea while working? Hmm, okay. I carried the tea tray upstairs and quickly hid in a room near his office. After a while, I saw Lily come up and put her ear close to the door, muttering. Why hasn't Dad yelled at her yet? Is she flirting with him again? This fox! Then she immediately flung the door open, thinking she's going to catch me red-handed. <laughs> you see, I know that Lucas only drank coffee while working, and also, he hated being disturbed. At this point, I slowly entered the room and saw him shouting at his beloved daughter. I already said that no one could enter this room without my permission. I pretended not to understand what was going on at that time and hurriedly placed the tea tray on the table. Sir, mistress ordered me to bring you some tea. Both of you get out, now! Lily glared at me angrily and walked out. It serves her right for trying to get me into trouble. It's crazy how fast time flies. The last day of casting was the next day already. I stayed up late to practice some more, when suddenly Lily burst in and tore up my script. I forbid you to audition for this role. It'll be mine anyway. So just give up and save yourself the humiliation. Puff, what to do with this delusional girl? The next morning, I woke up early to get ready but when I went to open my door, it wouldn't budge. Oh no, it was locked from the outside. Lily had to be behind this. I opened the window and peered down. Hmm, it wasn't too high, so I tied my clothes together into a rope to climb down. But halfway down, a shirt suddenly ripped and I fell into someone's arms. I scrambled to my feet and turned to see Jack. He was rubbing his arm while frowning at me. You love falling into my arms, don't you? I'm in a rush. I don't have time to argue with you. I grabbed my bag and was about to leave when an idea popped into my mind. Can you take me to the studio right away? Jack was a bit surprised at first, but he eventually agreed. I transformed while in the car. I took off my wig and brown contact lenses, put on some makeup, and voila! Beautiful Jenny was back. Jack couldn't help but gape at me in surprise. You, you, what's going on? But there was no time to explain. We'd already arrived at the studio. I hopped out of the car and hurried inside to audition. The director called my name at the exact moment I entered the set. I quickly regained my composure and stepped onto the stage where Mrs. Sharma was already waiting. I told myself I wouldn't let her frazzle me this time. 
As expected, she tried to throw me off by changing the situation and dialogue. But I took inspiration from my difficult times being Lily's maid and performed my heart out. When I finished, the whole film set started to applaud. Some of them even had teary eyes, which made me burst with happiness. After a while of discussion, the director stood up and was about to announce the results when Lily suddenly appeared. She turned on the projector and asked everyone to watch an important video. Is she trying to expose me right now? But, oh, it was a video of Mrs. Sharma talking to the director. Jenny Sinclair is my daughter. I only want the best for her. Please accept my request. Oh my gosh. So, the rumor about my mom being a famous actress is true. It was Mrs. Sharma who chose her career over me. I fell to my knees and looked at Mrs. Sharma, whose eyes were full of guilt. Everybody took out their phones to take pictures and videos. My ears were ringing, hearing thousands of questions buzzing around. Suddenly, the light went out. In the dark, a hand pulled me out of the crowd. It was Jack. He put his jacket over me and then secretly took me to the car. Jack drove for an hour to a deserted beach. The two of us sat on the sand and stared out at the sea. Suddenly, Jack turned to face me and took my hand in his. If you've decided to become an actress, having to face the public backlash over a rumor, whether it's the truth or not, is unavoidable. No matter what everyone says, you just need to stay true to yourself and believe in the rightful things you did. I smiled slightly at Jack. It turned out that behind this scandalous bad boy image was actually a really brave guy who had been through a lot in this tough industry. Jack took me home after sunset, and as soon as I reached the front porch, I heard quarreling. So I slowly opened the door, kept my ear to the ground, and gently peeked into the living room. Oh my god. Mrs. Sharma is here? Why did you leave her for 18 years, then come back and mess things up like that? You know very well that I did no such thing. You're the one who prevented me from seeing her. I've always watched Jenny from afar. There's not a single photo of her that I don't keep. If you love her, why did you drag her into acting? You want her to have a suffocating life, always being watched by thousands of people, not having a single day of freedom like you? Meanwhile, I can provide her with a comfortable, pressure-free life. I don't want her to be an actress either. I was the one who asked the director not to give her the lead role. I also want her to have a peaceful life. So I've tried everything in my capability to make her fail the casting. Unbelievable. So that's the truth? Dad, why did you hide mom away from me? Do you know how much it sucked not having a mom? Jenny, why are you here? Just hear me out. I don't want to hear anything. Jenny, let me explain. Miss Sharma, acting is my passion. You abandoned me to chase yours, but now you want to forbid mine? How ridiculous! Both of you keep saying you're doing what's best for me, but have you ever asked me how I feel? I hate you both! I ran to my room, slammed the door, then cried my eyes out until I fell asleep. When I woke up, I saw a bunch of notifications on my phone. Turns out Miss Sharma went live and publicized her side of the story. The article showed the room full of my pictures from baby to grown up. She talked about how when she divorced my dad, even though she loved me dearly, she thought he'd be able to provide me with a better life, so she gave him full custody. So it turns out I do have a famous actress mom, and she does love me. I guess it must have been hard for mom. And she must have suffered a lot, too. Looking at the pictures of my childhood preserved by her, tears welled up in my eyes. At that moment, my maid rushed in. Miss, congratulations! They picked you! The maid showed me the phone screen. In front of me was an article titled, Jenny Sinclair Chosen as the Servant's Leading Lady. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief. This is real, right? It's real, miss. Look, even your casting clip has reached millions of likes, and the comments are full of praise for your method acting. Everyone supports you. I jumped up and hugged my maid, tears streaming down my face. Finally, I've achieved my dream.
So, what now? Well, as you can see, I made it. This is the movie premiere. I'm here with my mom. She accompanied me on set and taught me a lot. Suddenly, a firm hand wrapped around my waist from behind. It was Jack. He's always playfully sweet like that. The three of us posed for photos and greeted our fans. The media these days keeps shipping me with Jack. They say we're a case of on-screen romance turning into real-life lovers. But, hmm, that's not quite right. Seeing as we actually fell in love before filming even started. <laughs> oh, that person over there. Is that really my dad? Oh my, today is indeed the happiest day of my life. Having dad's support for my passion like this means everything to me. I'm well on my way to becoming an excellent actress like my mom. Or, who knows, maybe even better. This was my first day at my new school, and so far, it was going pretty well. Can you believe the principal himself was giving me the guided tour, as well as showering me with praise? Amber, with your impressive grades and outstanding academic achievements, you'll fit in nicely here. This is Leo, my son. He's another excellent student here, and he's going to show you around. Leo looked at me from head to toe, then smiled and winked at me. Huh? Was he checking me out? And here's the library. Maybe we could study here together sometime. Um, sorry, but I prefer to study alone. Right at that moment, a guy walked past us to the librarian's desk. Oh. My. God. He totally had this whole cool bad boy look going on. I zoomed in to see what book he was holding. The Orion Mystery? Wow. Nice taste. I've been really into ancient stuff these days too. Leo must have noticed me staring at that guy as he snidely said, I'd steer clear of the likes of him if I was you. His grades are pathetic and he's probably only in here so he can take a nap. He's below your league, while I'm far more suitable. Thanks for showing me around, but seeing your smug and scornful attitude towards others proves otherwise. Then I left, leaving a stunned-looking Leo behind. I found my class easily enough, even without Leo's help. And my desk? Yeah, there was no missing that. I mean, the huge bouquet with my name on it and a welcome hamper full of candy was a dead giveaway. And apparently, it was from the principal. Whoa. I knew he was glad I was here, but wasn't this a bit too much? Anyway... I shared all the flowers and candies with my classmates to get to know them better. So far so good, and these two sweet girls Jane and Ellie walked to the canteen with me and showed me how to get the lunch tray using my student QR code. But then they pointed over to a group of students sitting next to the window and told me to go sit with them. Huh? Why can't I sit with you? You're not one of us. Then they went and joined another group. What did they mean by that? I looked around and noticed there were two menus, a delicious looking one on the red board and a bland one on a blue board. Hmm. It seemed the boards correlated to the trays, as more kids than not had the blue trays with the dull foods. I took my red tray full of tasty food and walked over to the window, where all the kids were sitting with red trays, including Leo. Hmm. There's something really strange about this school. I was pretty awkward and didn't know what to do when I saw the Orion Mystery Boy walking in with a blue tray. So, without thinking, I approached him. I saw you this morning in the library. You were checking out my favorite book. So, should I return the book or what? No, no, I just want to make friends. Stop hanging out with this loser. A straight A student like you should sit with us. We're different, see? This was so stupid. So I told Leo I didn't need colored trays to tell me who I could and couldn't talk to, and that I was fully capable of making my own mind up. Leo and his friends looked furious, while the Orion mystery boy just grinned. Suddenly a girl in the group spoke up with a super cold tone. Don't worry, Leo. This new girl will soon figure out what losers they are. Then she signaled for the whole group to leave. After that, the Orion mystery boy and I started talking. And he finally told me his name. It's John. Hmm. 
The blue tray kids were really nice. Way nicer than the red tray ones. I asked John what the deal with the trays was, and he said that this school divided its students into two groups. The red were top achievers, and therefore got better food, cleaner spaces at the canteen, just everything. While the blues were made to eat bland food and squashed into the corner of the canteen. Poof, this whole thing was dumb. So I continued hanging out with John and his friends. Only Leo and that girl he was with, Quinn, didn't approve. Turns out she's the best student around here, and that made her the leader of the Reds. On many occasions, Quinn and her minions had pulled me aside after class to tell me I should stay away from the Blues. But I didn't care. Then one day, the school announced that it was looking for the next school president. I wasn't that interested in it, but my friends were eager for me to sign up. If you're president, then you could make things fairer around here. Right. Better food, better tables and chairs. Please, we need you. Well, they did have a point. I really wanted them to have better things. And I suppose being school president would look good on my profile. So I signed up. But wow, I didn't think I'd be this popular. My friends completely supported me, made colorful banners and helped me come up with catchy slogans. And you know what? In the end, I got to the final round. Whoop! Now all I had to do was beat Quinn. But then, something awful happened at the school. I arrived to find a bunch of students gathered around something. I squeezed through the crowd and... Oh my god. The principal's beloved portrait was covered in red paint. Then across the loudspeakers, two names were called to the principal's office. John's and... Mine! Do you two know why I've summoned you here? John and I shared confused looks. No, huh? My portrait has been vandalized, and I know that Amber, you were the last one who passed the security guard yesterday. And John, you were caught on CCTV climbing over the back gate. Can you both please explain what you were doing so late at school? I couldn't find my math book, and I have an important math test coming up. So I came back to try and find it. And what about you, John? I knew it. An exemplary student such as Amber would never do such a thing. But a troublemaker like you, on the other hand, you're expelled. I didn't do it. Please reconsider, sir. Please give me some time so I can find the one who's responsible. Very well. Seeing as it's you, Amber, I shall allow you one week to prove this boy's innocence. Him or his guilt. When we left the office, I asked John why he was sneaking about the school late at night, but he got all defensive. I had a thing, and it's none of your business. If you want to believe it was me, then do. Didn't you see what I just did? I defended you. Can't you just tell me? I had a thing, okay? My thing that you don't need to know. Then he left. I stood there feeling confused when Quinn, Leo, and their group walked towards me. Don't waste your time with him. Sooner or later, he's gonna be expelled. Right, Quinn? But Quinn ignored him, then gave me a dagger look. I'm gonna say this one last time. Stay away from him. And they all left. Hmm. Why was Leo so sure that John would be expelled? I know they all hated John, especially Quinn. Could it be that they framed him? Well, there's only one way to find out. I needed to keep a close eye on Quinn and see what she was up to. So after school, I followed Quinn all the way to the harbor. Hmm, it's like she was waiting for someone. Um, what on earth are you doing? My god, I had to press my hands over my mouth so I didn't start screaming. Turns out he noticed that I was following Quinn, so he followed me too in case I do something stupid. Suddenly, Quinn took her phone out to call someone. But then a strange thing happened. John's phone started vibrating. Um, why is Quinn calling you? John took his phone out and showed me the screen. It's just my mom. And when I turned around to see what Quinn was doing, she'd gone. Ugh, I lost her. I've been following Quinn for a whole week, but it's led to nothing. <sighs> I was so deep in my thoughts, 
that I accidentally dropped someone's backpack and all their stuff fell out. Ugh, it's Quinn's. Better pick everything up before she comes back. But then I saw something that caught my attention. It was a receipt for... Red paint. Jackpot. I knew it was her. John was skipping classes today, so I took a detour to his house after school to tell him. Huh? Why was Quinn standing outside his door? There was something seriously fishy going on here, so I followed them. They stopped at an abandoned house nearby, and I eavesdropped on their conversation. I think Amber knows something. Last time, we were lucky she didn't catch us dating at the harbor. But this time, what if she finds out? I've been working so hard for this school president campaign. I knew she'd go back for her math book. It would have been fine if the school didn't have that new camera at the back gate. Tomorrow, I will confess to the principal that I did it. You didn't do it yourself anyway. Oh god, I couldn't believe it. Turns out, Quinn was meeting John at the harbor, so when she called someone, it was actually him. But being an expert at this secret dating game, he had her number saved as mom. They were hiding their relationship this whole time. And worse, they tried framing me so Quinn would win the election. Unbelievable. I couldn't stay quiet any longer, so I stepped out in front of them, told them I'd heard everything and that I was going to tell the principal. Then I ran off without letting them say a word. The next day, I was en route to the principal's office when I passed Quinn tearing down her election posters on the wall. Why are you doing that? It's okay. I know I don't deserve to be school president. Hmm. I thought you wanted to be president more than anything in the world. Why else would you play dirty tricks on me? So, Quinn explained to me that she was running for school president to eliminate the discrimination here, so that she didn't have to hide her relationship with John any longer. Oh wow, I didn't know. I didn't expect her to have such a meaningful motive behind all this. My plan was just to fight for better things for the Blues team. But man, Quinn had a vision to change this whole school. Impressive. And there's one more thing. Since you're the principal's favorite student, we were afraid that if you become school president, despite your best efforts, things here would only get worse. So there was no other way for us. We had to. I'm sorry. It seems like I misjudged Quinn. And I didn't want John to get expelled, so I said that I'd take the blame for the portrait incident. But it's all my fault. You don't need to do that. No worries. I'm sure to ace the math test and win a prize for the school, so there's no way he's gonna punish me. So at recess, I was heading to the principal's office. But before I could get there, I found myself being dragged into the janitor's closet. Oh, it was John. He was feeling guilty and didn't want me to take the fall. I was about to reply to him when I heard two familiar voices in the science room next to us. It was Quinn and Leo. Oh my god, we could hear them clearly through the ventilation hole. <laughs> I can't believe it worked. Amber is such a fool. There's no way she'll be allowed to run for president and victory will be mine. So, are you really going to remove the division between the two groups just to freely date your stupid boyfriend in public? <laughs> are you fooled by that too? Of course I won't. No way! That was only to trick Amber and John. What I'm going to do is make sure all troublemakers are going to be kicked out of school. What? I got played? Again? Ugh! I turned to John and, oh man, he looked disappointed. Don't worry, I know a way to get back at them. On election day, Quinn gave her speech, and unsurprisingly, she went on about how the Red Group brings more to the school and therefore deserves their privileges. She really believes she could make a fool out of this Amber, huh? When I stepped out on the stage, her jaw dropped. Yeah, Quinn, I didn't confess to the principal. Giving speeches in front of a crowd wasn't something new to me, so I was super confident. I'm sure you're all aware of how this school operates. We're divided into two groups and get treated very differently. What I see here is discrimination and prejudice, when in reality, this should be a safe place for all students to strive and reach their full potential. So I'm standing here today to tell you that if you choose me to be your next school president, 
I will break the barrier. Let's say goodbye to red and blue trays and hello to fairness and equality. After my speech ended, the crowd went wild. Wow. And surprisingly, some of the red group were cheering me too. Hmm. You're probably wondering why I didn't expose Quinn in front of the whole school, right? As I see it, she'd had a massive reality check. So I think that was enough. I also spotted the principal quietly sneaking off with his head down in the midst of cheers the whole school gave me. Could you guess who won? Yeah, me of course. <laughs> John came on stage and handed me flowers in front of a furious looking Quinn. I walked towards her and whispered, let's see how you're gonna get rid of the troublemakers now. She just sneered at me then stormed off the stage. Later, we heard that Quinn confessed all to the principal. Then she transferred to another school. What about me? Well, after I became school president, I stuck to my promise and began making some serious changes to the unfairness of the school. And John, did we become a couple, you ask? Oh no, we're just close friends. <laughs> I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi, I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe, the girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idols concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh, why were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm. I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP, forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow. And that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it, from attentive service, amazing live music, and great food. It was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh my god, that's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away. No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time. This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um, wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac, the missing singer! I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. 
gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac? Are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. So, last night, when we were separated in the after-concert chaos, Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh! She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then, we've already parted ways last night, but... But my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job. How can she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope. You must help us, please. Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in 10 years. This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not so good ones, especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress. Take it off right now! Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room 
and even stopped to pose at the end. Poof, it's just an old dress. Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends, and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine! I didn't want to share a bed with her! But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs! Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh! It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So, I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him. But then, everything fell apart. And I hadn't touched the piano since, well... <sighs> until today, I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing? I was completely immersed in this beautiful harmony that me and my dad were playing until... What on earth are you two doing? Startled, I turned around to see Siren standing there with fiery eyes. Oh God. I came back to my senses at once and realized that next to me, the man I was jamming with was not my dad, but Isaac, her boyfriend. Oh no, what had I done? I quickly wiped my tears away and was about to leave. But Isaac took my hand and gave me this confused look. Being back here in this house was difficult enough without getting involved in this love triangle. So I tried to pull my hand free and ran out of there. Yes, it's me again, Hazel. In the last part of my story, my friends embroiled me into helping their idol Isaac and his actress girlfriend Siren escape from the public eye for a bit. Now I'm stuck in my family's old home and having to confront my past. All these memories flooded my mind. Some good, some bad. And before I knew it, I was mixing the past with reality. And that's how I accidentally played the piano with Isaac and made Siren green with envy. At that moment, Siren swung open the door and charged toward me. Hey, don't let me catch you flirting with my BF again! Excuse me? What did you say? He's not even my type. Besides, having you as a love rival sounds like way more hassle than it's worth. She gave me this lingering scowl. Clearly she was furious with me, but she must have decided there was nothing else she could say on this matter. However, this didn't stop her from being the most demanding, frustrating diva on the planet. She stuck her nose up at the food and drinks we served her and insisted that she couldn't possibly consume anything that wasn't organic. She threw the clothes that we lent her down the stairs cause, quote, those vulgar outfits didn't suit her. 
Then she asked Ivy to go get her designer ones. Once, Zoe even had to drive over an hour to the mall just for a few scented candles. Why, you ask? Well, Siren accused me of exuding this bad energy that had been affecting her sleep and her well-being, so she needed to cleanse the aura around here. Poof, this was nonsense. Once her head touched the pillow, she slept like a log. It seems that living in the same house as their idol and his girlfriend wasn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. Isn't that right, Ivy and Zoe? However, contrary to Siren the Nightmare, Isaac surprised me quite a lot by actually being a great help around the house. He was an excellent cook and a dab hand at fixing things. Okay, I admit that I used to think he was just one of those useless celebs out there, but it seems he had no problem with pulling his weight. Anyway, this manner of his did somewhat make up for the obnoxious attitude of his girlfriend, which made this whole thing a bit more bearable. Until this one time, we were rowing on the river near the mansion. Well, I was rowing to be exact, just me, as what could we expect from our two superstars? But it's pretty out here, isn't it? It was Siren's bright idea, as she wanted some new Insta photos. You're probably wondering where Zoe and Ivy are? Yep, they're scouring the shops a few towns over for ethical foie gras. Look at her, saying she's feeling sick she couldn't row. But apparently, she was well enough to smile for the camera and strike dozens of different poses. Suddenly, Siren decided to stand up to get better lighting, which made the whole boat shake. I shouted at her to sit down, but then before I properly knew what was going on, the boat was turning sideways and I tumbled into the water. I flailed my arms and legs out and tried my best to raise my head above the water, but it was no use. I couldn't stop myself from sinking beneath it. I honestly believed this was it. The world started to darken around me, when suddenly, an arm grabbed me and pulled me ashore. Hazel, can you hear me? I slowly opened my eyes and saw Isaac's worried face peering down at me. Hazel, thank goodness. He gently helped me sit up, then asked me if I was all right. For a few fleeting moments, the warmth from his body made me flush. Clearly, nearly drowning had made me delirious. I mean, I couldn't have feelings for him. Could I? Before I could ponder on this thought anymore, a drenched siren dripped her way over to us. Isaac, why did you rescue her instead of me? Siren, this is not the time for being dramatic. I was hardly going to come to you, an expert swimmer, over Hazel who was actually drowning. Hearing Isaac say that, she rolled her eyes, then stormed off, leaving a wet footprint trail in her wake. The last thing we needed in the house was more tension, so I immediately turned to him and said I was fine, and he should go and sort things out with his girlfriend. Listen, Hazel, Siren's not my girlfriend. I don't like her in that way, but as for you and me, we clearly have a connection. I stared at him in complete open-mouthed shock. Did he really just say that? Or perhaps I had a concussion and was imagining things? Siren's like my little sister. I'll explain this later, but first you need to rest. Then he wrapped his arms around me and guided me back to the house. I spent the rest of that day in bed feeling feverish. Then at dawn the next morning, I awoke to a commotion coming from downstairs. Guys? <sighs> What's all the noise about? It's Isaac and Siren! They've gone! And they've taken the car! What? That was our only mode of transport out of here! How could they be so selfish to just abandon us here like this? We tried contacting Isaac countless times, but no answer. Great, here we are now in this remote area where it would take hours to even find a passerby to hitchhike, not to mention how risky it'd be. Everything was a mess. We were panicking when suddenly the door burst open and walked in a smiling, arm-linked Isaac and Siren. Where have you been? You can't just leave like that without telling us. Oh, Ivy lent us the car. Didn't she say anything? Both Zoe and I turned our gazes on Ivy. She stammered. But, but I think you guys just went out for a while, not disappeared all night unreachable. Relax, all this tension will give you wrinkles. Then Siren smirked at me as she flicked back her hair and then continued. We went to a drive-in cinema and it was so romantic. 
We didn't want the evening to end, so we strolled around town until the early hours. What did she mean by that? So much for him seeing her as a sister. I felt like such a fool for believing his lies. We altered our entire plans to help you both hide from society, and this is how you thank us? By pulling a stunt like this? No more. Get out of here! Right now! Before anyone could say anything, my phone buzzed. It was my friend Erica. She asked me if the stories about me being in love with Isaac were true. Huh? What was she on about? In my panic, I ended the call and went online to check it out. Turns out on the Instagram account of the store where I customized our matching hoodies, the shop owner had posted a photo of me wearing it. Naturally, it didn't take the fan maniacs long to do their research and find out all about me. But worse still, another current trending post was one from Isaac's management company, confirming that we were officially dating. What kind of nonsense is this? I immediately told Isaac to call his company and put it on speaker. Isaac, we hit a jackpot! You probably know the iconic pianist and composer Edward Moretz, right? Hazel Moretz is his daughter! You... you mean... Everyone gasped at me in shock. Maybe it's time for me to reveal the secrets of my past, the truth that's been hidden for so long. Yes, Edward Moretz is my father but I made a promise to myself 10 years ago that I would never speak to him again. Isaac's manager continued to brazenly talk about how the scandal with me would benefit Isaac's career, so there was no need to hide it. At that moment, Siren shouted, What on earth are you saying? Hey, are you with Siren again? I already told you not to mess with that girl unless you want to get yourself in trouble. Shut up! Siren furiously grabbed Isaac's phone and ended the call. Isaac, tell everyone that the one you love is me, not her. Siren, we were never in love. You're going too far. What? You guys aren't dating? So we misunderstood it all from the beginning? I knew right away there was something wrong. Yet you pretended to be his real girlfriend and treated us like your minions. Siren stood there with a red face, fists clenched. I gave you my heart, but all you do is hurt me. This time, you've made a big mistake, Isaac. Just wait and see! Siren left for her room, but this time neither of us stopped her or comforted her. The next morning, we found out that Siren was gone. None of us knew where she was. We all just hoped that she wasn't so fueled with anger that she'd cause us even more problems. We quickly packed our things into the car, preparing to return to our normal life. When out of nowhere, a bunch of reporters and journalists appeared and surrounded us. Isaac, Miss Sirenwild has accused Ms. Moretz of wrecking your relationship. Is this true? Does that mean you ran away from all the shows to go on a secret date with Ms. Moretz? Ms. Moretz, your father was known for breaking not only yours, but also another family apart. All for his own selfish needs. Are you following in his footsteps? Scary flashlights were everywhere. Suddenly I found myself transported back to that terrible day ten years ago when Dad's affair went public, and the reporters hounded us in this exact same spot. Those heartless flashlights are just as intense now as they were back then. A memory of my mom's distraught face popped into my mind. Puffy eyes, tear-stained cheeks, a fearful look. Yet the reporters were relentless vultures, firing questions at her regardless of her vulnerable state. That's the day I made a promise to myself that not only would I never pursue music, but I'd also never forgive my father. Amid the panic, an arm pulled me into the car, and we drove away from the crowd. It was Isaac. He put on some piano music to help calm me down, and he continued driving, eventually stopping at a small grocery store. Hazel, please drink this. Sorry for dragging you into all this. The thing is, I've been unhappy with my management company for a while now. They won't let me make the music I want to, but I didn't expect them to go as low as forcing me into their web of lies just for fame. I know how you feel. I used to long to become a pianist like my dad, but then he crushed my dreams. To further his career, he cheated on my mom with another married woman and left our family behind. I grew to hate the complex world of artists. I vowed to never become one of them. And then I gradually began to despise the sound of the piano, too. I'm sorry to hear that story. But art isn't to blame. It reflects lies genuinely, doesn't it? 
I heard your piano melodies and you are truly gifted. Be honest with your feelings and don't let anyone else interfere with them. Trying to deny your own passion and emotions will only make you miserable. Isaac's right. I'd let my dad's mistakes alter the pathway to my dreams. Not making music made me miserable. It felt like there was a part of me missing. One that nothing else could fill. Why should I be the one to suffer like this? When it hadn't even been me that done anything wrong. Look at me now. Can you believe it? I've rekindled my passion for piano, and now I'm happier than ever. After all that runway pop star drama, Isaac left his management company and collaborated with me to make music for true art. This is our latest charity event. It's pretty neat, huh? That's all thanks to Zoe and Ivy. They work for us now. They're in charge of arranging our busy schedules and organizing our events. The four of us make the best team. I guess you're wondering what happened to Siren? Last I heard, she set her sights on her latest movie co-star. Hmm. Wish her good luck is all I can say. As for Isaac and me, well, since the media claimed that we were a couple, we might as well have turned that fake news into reality. Hi there, I'm Flora, Portside High School cheerleading captain and beauty pageant queen. My natural beauty and charisma mean that everyone's drawn to me, but hey, I don't make it easy for them. I only allow a select few to get close to me as I can't be seen associating with just anyone. Only my classmate Nina is pretty enough to have the coveted position of my BFF. Birds of a feather flock together, right? My high school life was perfect. But then, in the space of one day, that all changed. The principal, Mrs. Harrington, told me that due to my cheerleading abilities, I'd won a scholarship to the ACL Academy, a boarding school for the athletically gifted. And I was leaving today! Huh? This made no sense! I mean, I don't even do sports! I rushed straight home to discuss it with my mom and found her sitting on the couch surrounded by a load of shopping bags. Yep. She'd already spent the scholarship money before I'd even found out the news. I know mom loves money, but how could she make such a huge decision about my life without discussing it with me first? Ugh. Looks like I had no choice but to leave Portside High behind and go to this stupid sports school. Whatever. I'm a skilled cheerleader after all. It'd be a breeze, right? Wrong. This new school sucked. On my very first day here, I was woken up at 6 a.m. and forced to run five laps around the stadium. God, are these people superheroes or what? How are they able to run and laugh at the same time while I'm panting like crazy? I didn't have time to catch my breath when the teacher made us move to the gym to lift weights. After three hours in the hellish gym, I barely had time to digest my lunch before they steered me into the volleyball court. Yep, that's the sport mom had registered me for. Ugh, this stupid sport! Finally, nighttime arrived, and I managed to crawl my aching body back to my dorm. God save me from this living nightmare! Suddenly, the door opened, and in stepped my three roomies, aka my volleyball teammates. Honestly, I don't even know if I could call them girls or not. One has super short cropped bangs, one doesn't say much and shuffles more than walks, and one wears clothes so baggy they resemble a tent. Obviously, I'm way out of their league. And you know what they all have in common? They're always sweaty. So gross. Come to think of it, I have to go take a shower ASAP. Otherwise, I might turn into one of them. Fresh out of the shower, I called Nina and blurted out how exhausted I was and how much I missed our school. Who are you? You must be so tired. Oh, by the way, I have some amazing news to tell you. There's a city beauty pageant coming up and I'm representing the school. What? But I won the school beauty contest. Yeah, you did. But you don't attend Portside High anymore, so seeing as I came second, they've given me the spot. Too bad, as you definitely would have won. What? How unfair! I was still in shock when the dorm supervisor stormed in and took away my phone. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. This school even has a strict 10 p.m. phones away and lights off rule. It's all because they believe health is the most precious thing for an athlete. I tossed and turned all night. This beauty pageant was massive, and there's no way I could miss it. But I'm not at Portside High anymore. Instead, I'm stuck in this dumb jock academy. Hmm, if only I could get out of here. Huh, that's right. I have a brilliant idea. 
I need to get expelled. So I decided to skip practice and go cause some havoc for three days straight. I poured paint into the pool, cut off the badminton strings, deflated all of the soccer balls, and of course, I made sure that the security cameras caught it all. And as expected, the principal eventually called me into his office. Yes, this was the moment I was waiting for. Soon I could pack and get out of here. Only the rest didn't exactly go to plan. If it had not been for Mrs. Harrington. Two laps of frog jumps around the soccer field, now! What? Frog jumps? I hate those things! Why couldn't he just kick me out already? But wait, what does Mrs. Harrington have to do with this? After my punishment, I needed to vent. So, hugging my aching thighs, I called Nina to complain about my failed plan. And she just burst out laughing. <laughs> oh, Flora, those outdated tricks were never gonna work. You have to do something bold, like... <gasps> oh my god, Nina is a genius! The next night, following Nina's instructions, I sneaked out when everyone was asleep. That's right, I'm going to wake the whole school up with these firecrackers. I lit one in the dorm's backyard, then ran to hide behind the bushes. Three, two, one, and... Silence, huh? I went back to check and saw that it had gone out. What's wrong? Is this one broken? I tried again and again, but the same thing happened each time. As if a ghost did it? Just the thought of it sent chills down my spine, so I sprinted right back to my room. Okay, so not only had my plan been a massive fail, but it had left me super tired. Needless to say, this morning's run was not fun. Zombie alert! Hmm, how come they look even more exhausted than me? Hey, have you guys heard about the doomed jock? He's the ghost in the dorm's backyard. Allegedly, he attended this academy years ago, and he exercised himself to death right there in the dorm's backyard. So now, he haunts it. What was she talking about? Could it be the one who messed with me yesterday? Was the doomed jock? I couldn't just give up like that. I needed to figure out a way to get out of this awful place before this ghost got me. Hmm. How about starting a fight? I heard that the fencing team and basketball team were the two toughest groups in the school. So, I sprayed paint on their fencing masks and punctured all of the basketballs and left a fencing sword at the scene. Then I wrote both teams an anonymous letter. Sunday, 2 p.m., abandoned building near the back gate. When Sunday came, I hid in the abandoned house and waited for the two groups to arrive. Look at their tense faces. This was going to be fun. I quickly called the cops, and then took advantage of the chaos to blend in with the feuding teams. I almost got punched in the face when, fortunately, the cops got there just in time, causing everyone to frantically flee the scene. I happily ran to a cop. It's me! I started this fight! But, to my surprise, the cop just asked if I was hurt. Then he hurriedly chased after the gang. Only then I realized that if I wanted to be caught, I had to do exactly what they did run away. Oh man. I was staggering my way back to the dormitory feeling deflated when I spotted the fencing and basketball teams coming my way. Freaked out, I looked around for a place to hide, but there was only one car parked on the side of the road. With no other way, I ventured to open the car door and, oh, it wasn't locked. I quickly jumped in, hid under the back seat, and lay completely still. At that moment, the car door swung open. I closed my eyes and braced myself to catch some hands when suddenly the car revved up and left. Looking up, I saw the principal sitting in the driver's seat, whistling happily. Oh, so it was his car. After a while, the car stopped in front of a bar in town. Didn't expect a serious man like him to go to such places. But wait, an underage student being caught by the principal here would surely get me expelled, right? With that in mind, I hurriedly followed him, but at the door, a security guard stopped me and asked for my ID card. I had no idea what to do when suddenly a strange guy appeared. Hey cutie, need an ID card? How about this? I'll lend you a fake ID to get in. In exchange, you must go out with me tonight. Sounds good, huh? Well, I didn't plan on sticking around for long, as I would just get in, find the principal, and get caught right away anyway. So I nodded in agreement. 
I was about to take the ID card from him when someone yanked me back and pushed me into a cab. My roommates! What are you doing here? Do you know you've just ruined my plan and- Ruined? Who's the one causing trouble here? Do you honestly believe that if you get expelled like that, your old school will take you back? <sighs> Fat chance. Huh? How'd you know that I'm trying to get expelled? Turns out my roommates overheard the conversation between me and Nina. It was them who extinguished my firecrackers in the campus backyard, then made up the doomed jock ghost story to make me stay away from there. Then, when the basketball and fencing team searched for me, it was them who lied that I was with them all day so I could get away with it. But what did you do that for? Don't get us wrong, we didn't do it for you. We did it to protect the school's reputation. Then they started telling me that, for the last few years, due to bad achievements, our school was on the chopping block to make space for industrial areas. The only way to convince the city council to keep our school was by winning the state's upcoming sports competition. We've all played sports for all of our lives. Sport is everything to us. If our school closes, we don't know where we'd go. That's why when we saw you being lazy and messing about, we couldn't just sit back and watch. Oh, I had no idea about this. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. I mean, of course I don't want to ruin their futures. I then also opened up to them and told them all about the beauty pageant. They insisted there must be a way to join the pageant without returning to my old school. So they searched around on Google, and guess what? Turns out the pageant accepts free candidates too, which means no school registration needed. What else could I wish for? I immediately signed up for it, and as a thank you to my new friends, I started making an effort at playing volleyball. I'm a tall girl, so my training position is a right side hitter. And you know what? There is this satisfaction whenever I was able to block a ball. Not gonna lie, this is much more interesting than I thought. That weekend, I went to the city to pick out some dresses for the beauty contest. I found myself immersed in racks of gorgeous gowns when a familiar voice startled me. How about this one, Mom? Stunning, sweetie. You're the most beautiful girl in this world. I don't know what possessed them to pick Flora over you. But no need to worry this time, as I have sent her far away. Yeah, that's where she belongs. I'll show them who's the true beauty queen now. What? No way! My old school principal is Nina's mom? And transferring me to the sports academy was part of her plan? Just so her daughter could go to the pageant? I was fuming. So as soon as Mrs. Harrington went outside to take a call, I walked straight over to confront Nina. I can't believe you're like that. Nina looked shocked at first, but then smirked as she said, Like what? Like someone who's far prettier, more talented, and crown-worthy than you? Thanks, sporty girl. I shoved past her and stormed out of there. Wait for it, Nina. We'll soon see who the real winner is. The next few weeks were crazy busy with volleyball practice and the pageant preparations. I may have only been a reserve, but I still wanted to give it my all to motivate the team. The sports competition soon arrived, and after two days of competing, the fate of the school came down to the final match. Our volleyball game! Talk about intense. It sucked it was on the same day as the beauty pageant, as I would have loved to be able to cheer them on from the player bench. But then, disaster struck. The girl who plays right side hitter sprained her wrist and couldn't play. The whole team looked so worried, and that made my heart ache. There was only one thing for it. I'd replace her. If I was quick, I could still make it to the beauty pageant afterward. Come on, Flora. Stay focused. Just one point left, and we'd win. Suddenly, the ball came flying at me. This was it. I hit it with all my might and... Score! We won! I was busy celebrating our victory when everyone suddenly asked me about the beauty pageant. Oh my god, I almost forgot. The match went on longer than I thought it would. My friends dragged me into the taxi, but when we got there, the show was already coming to an end. And worst of all, guess who was standing there wearing the winner's crown and looking all smug? Yep, Nina. Did you come to congratulate me? Thanks, bestie. Oh, you guys must be Flora's new friends. Hmm, that figures. How cute. Stop the act, Nina. Yes, they are my friends. They're not fake, and they're a thousand times more interesting than you. 
say whatever you want, but I'm a beauty queen now, and you're no longer at the same level as me. My friends started clenching their fists, so I quickly pulled them away before anything happened. Right at that time, an announcement came across the speaker. Attention, pageants. We've just discovered signs of voter fraud. Please stay inside the hall and await further confirmation. About 30 minutes later, the truth finally came out. Turns out, Nina's mom had paid for the voting texts. Needless to say, Nina had her crown taken off her immediately, and Mrs. Harrington also lost her principal job. <laughs> what goes around comes around, right? As for me, I'm not bothered about beauty pageants anymore. Instead, I have a new hobby, volleyball. Turns out I'm pretty good at it, and who knows, I might even become a professional player? And you know what the best part of all this is? I now have true friends by my side who I know will be willing to help me anytime and anywhere. You are probably wondering why all eyes are on us. This is nothing new. Actually, this pretty much always happens when we walk through school together. <gasps> Look, they're truly the high school version of Kim K and Paris Hilton, aren't they? Agreed. They're quite charming. Yeah, that's us. I'm Robin, and the Hilton to my Kardashian is Allison, my BFF. Don't let her snooty look fool you. She's actually a really nice girl who's always there for me. I never had to worry about a thing being with her. We've basically been inseparable since forever. Ugh, Candace, you so did that on purpose. Oops, sorry. It's just too hard for my eyes to notice something as lame as you. <laughs> Oh, really? So it has nothing to do with the fact you're afraid I'll take your cheerleading spot and beauty queen title? As if. You're no competition for me. <sighs> this wasn't a new thing. Because Allison is so beautiful and talented, she often gets into altercations with the jealous mean girls. Now, thanks to the Candace drama, we're late for class. We were hurrying along the corridor when suddenly Allison stopped. A poster caught our eyes. It was for the contest to find the new cheerleading captain. Perfect! I can't wait to win and wipe that smug grin off Candace's face. You... you're gonna register too? Of course I am! I'm gonna teach that girl a lesson. Just you wait and see. Oh, snap! The truth is... Um, I had also signed up for the competition and was waiting for the right time to tell Allison, but... Who knew she would suddenly become so determined to win this? If Allison found out I was going to be her rival, what would she think? Ugh, what should I do? I don't want to upset her, but I really need to win this competition too. Why, you ask? It's for one person. It was him, Steve, the basketball team captain, and also Allison's cousin. I've had a huge crush on him, but the problem is that he's not exactly short on fangirls, including Candace. I'd never be as forward as her, so I just watched him from afar. But what if I'm no longer a nobody and become the cheerleading captain? Then Steve would notice me, and I'd be confident enough to open my heart to him. Right? But things were way too difficult when I have to face up to not only Candace, the resident mean girl, but also Allison, my BFF. Great! It's true what they say. Putting something off will definitely come to bite you eventually. As I was having lunch with Allison in the cafeteria, Candace and her friends stopped in front of our table. So, you think you can compete with us? Go on then, eat up and grow strong, little girl. If you have a problem with me, then deal with me. Leave my friend alone. Okay, princess, not everything is about you. I'm talking to her. Oh wait, look at this lost puppy. Hasn't Robin right here told you that she's also competing for the cheerleading captain position? Then Candace and her friends left, leaving me to face Allison's surprise and anger. I... I was planning to... You really want to compete against me? I just want to try. I... Wow. I never expected you to stab me in the back like this. Unbelievable! Then she stormed off, leaving me there feeling dumbfounded, staring at my ruined lunch. I know I should have told her in the first place, but her reaction was way worse than I expected. For the rest of that day, I couldn't find her anywhere. Not at school, not at her house. So before going to bed, I texted her, saying how sorry I was, and that I also had my side of the story, which I would tell her all about. 
but only after the contest. This was just a little misunderstanding. My awesome Allison would forgive me by the break of dawn, right? But nope. After that, Allison started treating me like I was invisible. No matter how hard I tried to talk to her, she wouldn't listen and just said, I don't need any explanation, backstabber. Drop out of the contest, then we'll talk. Drop out? No way! I mean, I really need this. And hang on, why couldn't I try out? So what? I kept it a secret from her. Was I supposed to tell her every single thing that I did? It was so upsetting to see us falling apart like this, but I had to sort out my priorities too. So as heartbreaking as it was, I had to put aside this temporarily broken friendship to strive for the biggest goal right now, the captain title. I poured all my focus into cheer practice and often stayed late so I could hone my skills. All my hard work paid off when the teacher complimented my technique. Meanwhile, Allison only received negative feedback. I turned to give her an encouraging smile, but she gave me a hateful look back. Did she think I was the cause of her poor form or what? I was about to leave when Allison walked in. I said hi, but she just ignored me. Seeing that, Candace didn't miss her chance to mock us. Being betrayed by your best friend must suck. Oh dear, if it was me, I wouldn't be able to go to school. Allison angrily slammed the locker door shut and walked straight out of there, while Candace and her friends were laughing. Ugh, they were the worst. The day of the competition finally came and I was so nervous. But hang on, I couldn't spot Allison anywhere. I was trying to look for her when I heard my name over the loudspeaker. It's my turn already. I was backstage on standby when suddenly I heard someone talking about Allison having an accident and not being able to attend the competition. Oh my god, Allison, is she okay? But before I could run over to ask them more questions, I was pushed out to the stage. The music was already playing, but I felt too overwhelmed and anxious to start. Sensing my nerves, the whole stand gave me a round of applause to cheer me on. I looked down at the audience and took a deep breath, tried to concentrate, and started my performance. As soon as the music ended, the whole room burst into endless applause. The judges nodded and smiled at me. I was too worried about Allison to celebrate. So right after my performance, I rushed over to her house to check, but she didn't welcome me at all. How dare you show your face here? Not after what you did! What do you mean? I heard that you fell, so I rushed here right after the competition. Stop the act. I know you snuck up behind me and pushed me yesterday. Thanks to you, I had to quit the contest. What is she saying? Allison disappeared off upstairs. I rushed over to help her, but she pushed me over. Go away! We're not friends anymore! I was so upset that I burst into tears, and when I got up from the ground, I saw Steve standing at the bottom of the stairs. Did he see it all? I was so embarrassed that I fled as quickly as possible. And things didn't stop getting worse. I've never been so scared to go to school before in my life. It's all thanks to the school forum post accusing me of pushing Allison. Now my voting rank has dropped, and kids I don't even know are giving me dirty looks. Suddenly, Steve came up from nowhere and started talking to me. Allison hasn't been in a right mood recently. I'm sorry on her behalf. This was not a dream, right? Steve had never bothered with me before. So why now? For you, this is a lucky pouch containing Feng Shui gemstones. If you wish for something, confess to the pouch a sin of yours and the wish will come true. It's proportional to each other. The bigger the sin, the grander the wish. But use it carefully. As either opened or overused, it will weaken its energy. I watched as Steve turned his back and left. This was such a sweet thing for him to do. Especially as everyone else was treating me like I was a walking plague cloud or something. But did this pouch really have magic powers? I guess there's only one way to find out, right? I call upon the magical powers of this pouch to confess that I purposely hid the flashy dress Mom bought me, then lied that I'd lost it so I wouldn't have to wear it. I'm so sorry. I wish I'll get a good grade for my chemistry test tomorrow so she'll be happy. After making the wish, I carefully put it in my backpack, hoping tomorrow during the test it would work. But no, the last question was pretty much impossible. 
I sighed, thinking the A was about to slip out of my hand, when suddenly Kevin, the smartest guy in class, threw me a piece of paper when the teacher didn't notice. I stealthily opened it. Whoa! It was the answer to that one question I had left! I quickly filled in my paper without thinking any further. A few days after, I got my test results, and I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw an A in front of me! It must be the powers of the magic pouch, as normally Kevin didn't even talk to me. Fascinating. And so, I made a few more wishes, and they all came true. Once I even confessed that I accidentally spilled water and damaged my computer, and wished Mum would buy me a new one. Unbelievably, two days later, Mum bought me a MacBook and said it was an early birthday present. This pouch was a miracle, so it was time I used it for my most important wish. I call upon the magical powers of this pouch to confess that I kept this secret from Allison and practiced every night, then signed up for the cheerleader competition. I want to win just because I long for Steve's attention and to gain the confidence to confess to him. Please help her recover quickly and for us to make up and be as close as ever. After wishing, I breathed a sigh of relief. It felt good to finally get this all off my chest. The next day after school, I was pretending to be walking past the basketball court as usual when Steve called me over and handed me a bottle of juice. Looks like the pouch really exerts its power. I did- Actually, Robin, there's no magic. I just snuck a mini recorder in that pouch to figure out if you were the one to mess with Allison. I'm sorry. What? In that lucky pouch is a mini recorder? So it also means he heard everything, including my love confession? I blushed cherry red and didn't know how to react when he suddenly sighed. Hey, do you suspect anyone? I still want to find out who the culprit is. Candace? She has a grudge against Allison. <laughs> Candace, then I have a way. See you around. Since I found out that Steve knew I liked him, I've been wondering why he didn't give me a reaction back. Maybe his silence is rejection? As soon as I entered the cafeteria, I saw the crowd rushing around. Oh my god. It's Steve and... And Candace with linked arms! Wait, what was that in her hand? It sure looked a lot like a lucky pouch. Could it be? While Candace wasn't paying attention, Steve turned his head around, smiled, then winked at me. Oh, that's it! Steve was just acting so he could get information from her. The day after, Steve invited me to the treehouse in his garden to listen to Candace's recording. But it turns out, Candace was not the culprit that caused Allison's accident either. She just admitted to some nonsense slurs and pranks and wished to win the championship and for Steve to love and spoil her. Then who is it? Somehow Allison keeps insisting it's you. Hmm, how about you give Allison the pouch? I want to listen to her feelings too. And so, the magic pouch was also passed on to Allison. The next evening, after my late practice, Steve and I went to the park nearby to listen to Allison's confessions. Dear Magic Spell Pouch, I... I actually didn't fall. Robin was getting so good and I... Um... I wasn't confident that I'd win and losing to her would be humiliating. So... I spread the news that I had an accident so I didn't have to participate and blamed everything on her. Everyone loves her. Even Steve has a secret rush on her. Well, me? W what? That means it was all planned by Allison? And Steve had a crush on me? Is that true? My thoughts are all over the place right now. Then before I could blurt out a word, he took my hand to go to Allison's house. What is this, Allison? Can you explain this? So what? Why does such an ordinary girl like her get so many good things? I deserve it, not her! Allison... Why? Without even letting me finish my sentence, Allison slammed the door shut. At least I knew the truth now, right? Even though it sure was ugly. I really have nothing left now. I lost my best friend, and with only one more day until the voting for the contest comes to an end, it looks like Candace will win. But as soon as I stepped into the classroom, everybody rushed over to me and waved their phones in my face. Huh? Oh. There's a new post on the school forum. 
It turns out that Allison shared the truth, and even apologized to me. I knew it. My bestie is always a very kind person. Thanks to that, my vote soared and got to first place. And this is the moment I've been waiting for. The new leader of our cheerleading team is... Robin Smith. Through my ecstatic grin, I noticed someone standing from afar. It's Allison. Seeing me, she hurried away, but luckily I was able to catch her up. Allison, thank you. I'm sorry for hurting you like that. No, I'm the one at fault. I... I... Although it was awkward at first, we soon got past this, then managed to talk straight to each other. Allison apologized for everything, then she congratulated me and gave me a hug. Oh, right. Now that I'm the winner, I can confidently confess my feelings to Steve, right? <laughs> no need, because he already did that to me. Thank you for staying beside me, but Steve, I still wonder how that bag could fulfill all my wishes. The other things are understandable, but the MacBook was unreal. Um, yeah. I may have called your mom pretending to be the teacher and told her that a MacBook for studying was compulsory. I was sitting at my usual spot in the common room during break time. Coding, of course. Eyes glued to my MacBook Pro when suddenly, Evelyn, my best friend, barged in and ran straight over to a group of girls. Here she goes again. Guys, guys, I've got big news. You all know Helen, right? The cheerleader? Kay, she has a huge crush on Dean, so she went to the locker and it said yes. Now guess what? I just saw them in the hallway kissing. Ha! Huh? These gossip vultures will believe anything. Confused? Let me wrap it up for you. They were talking about this mysterious locker situated in the school's back alley. The creepy part was, it could actually speak and foretell your future love partner. For it to work, you had to visit the locker between 6 and 7 p.m. Tap on it exactly three times and say the spell. Roses are red, violets are blue, in a world of love, just we two. Then, ask it if you and your crush are compatible. If the locker said yes, then congratulations. But if no, then too bad. This proves it. The locker must have some sort of prophecy power. Of course, duh, you know why? Because it's possessed by a lovelorn spirit. <laughs> oh boy, if only these naive kids knew the truth. The mystical locker that they so worshipped was actually a product of advanced IT, of which the mastermind was moi. Didn't see that coming, did you? I'm Karina, by the way. But people like to call me Robot Girl because I'm a super proud tech genius. But kids my age didn't appreciate my talents as they only seemed to care about love. Especially Alicia over there. She despised IT and presumed that anyone into it was a stone-cold machine who'd never ever had a relationship. <laughs> so, being the tech was that I am, I had to come up with a brilliant plan to prove her wrong. I spent every bit of spare time I had coding. I hacked into the school system to collect students' infos, such as their star signs, blood type, hobbies, and career orientation. Then, I used this as a database to create a love compatibility calculator. And just like that, my first brainchild was born. Easy peasy! Using it was simple. All I had to do was insert the two names and it'd show me a yes or a no. Knowing how much my peers buy into the whole spiritual stuff, I devised my locker plan. I found this rusty locker at the dead-end alley behind our school, superglued a walkie-talkie inside, locked it well. Then, with the other walkie-talkie in hand, I stayed in the school equipment room, which is convenient enough to be on the other side of the wall. To top it up a notch, I even used a voice changer app to get a perfect ghostly haunted tone. Then, I anonymously spread rumors about the locker's magical powers onto the school's blog. My trick quickly took off, and since launch day, 15 couples have been successfully matched. Can you imagine? True love? Oh, please. It all came down to some simple algorithms. That's all. But, one more thing. I hadn't exactly told Evelyn about this. Yeah, I love her, but 
She's not the best at keeping secrets. To be exact, she's a walking speaker who couldn't help but blab any gossip she'd heard to the entire school. Anyway, I needed to test if the locker actually worked first. Then I'd tell her, maybe when I reach 20 successful couples. Luckily for me, keeping this one secret from her turned out to be easy, as her attention was all on her crush, Jace, the school's hot boy. In her eyes, Jace was like an angel or something. It seems like I'm the only one who didn't get the gooey eyes memo. One evening, I was taking my locker shift when I heard a familiar voice. Evelyn's! Oh boy, I could already guess she wanted to ask about her and Jace. The algorithm said yes, and I could hear Evelyn screaming ecstatically at the announcement. <sighs> Fine, if she's happy, I'm happy. But it didn't last long, as an hour later, just as I was about to leave, more footsteps came towards the locker and I heard a knock on it. Roses are red, violets are blue. Hold on, Jace? What was he doing out here? Can I become a couple with Karina? What? No way! Had something hit his head? I immediately said no. No calculator needed for that. He stayed silent at first, but then asked again if I'd be his girlfriend. The answer was still no. He asked the locker again and again, but no, no, no. Jeez, what's with this guy? The next day at school, I noticed Evelyn's wearing her lucky lilac dress. Oh no, was she going to confess to Jace? I had to stop this. Hey, I have an emergency thingy. You need to come with me. Karina, what are you doing? But it was too late as Jace was approaching us. Hey, what are you playing? Tug of war? <laughs> oh, I think you messed up your hair. Here, let me. Jeez, he wasn't necessarily close. And the worst part was that Evelyn just witnessed the whole thing. Right at that moment, the bell rang and she left for class. Jace, this idiot! The locker said no already. And there he went, messing it all up. Now... I had to wait till the end of class to explain things to Evelyn. But things weren't that easy, as every time I tried to approach her, she gave me this flustered look then hurried away. One time, I managed to reach her, but then, yep, you guessed it, Shameless Jace showed up and ruined the conversation. Gosh, this leech wouldn't quit bothering me. In math class, he asked the teacher to let him change from Evelyn's group to mine because he suddenly wanted me to tutor him. The worst part was, the more I tried to ignore him, the more interested in me he seemed to get. Until one day, as I was running away from him, I bumped into someone. It was the school's head boy, Killian. Oh man, I was sure I was in trouble, but... Can you see her bothering her? Quit it already. Did Killian just defend me? But, uh-oh, that sure made Jace mad. It's none of your business. Excuse me, this is a library, not a theater club. Keep quiet or out. Phew, thank God I got out of there. But, come to think of it, that was a strange thing for the normally stern-faced Killian to do. Hmm, whatever. I don't have time to think about this right now. So far, the locker had predicted 19 couples successfully. I just needed one more match, then I could proudly make my invention public. And voila! My app would change the whole world's dating scene. Here it is, my 20th client. Wait, isn't that... Killian? And guess who he's asking about? Yeah, me! Maybe everyone was right about the robot girl nickname. Cause how could I be so clueless all this time about Jace and now... Kilian. I inserted the data, and the result was a no. But hang on, what if I dated Kilian? Would that make Jace give up and stop bothering me? And Evelyn wouldn't keep her distance from me anymore. It settled. The locker pronounced yes. Monday morning, I was in the study hall, working on the math group project with Jace, when a note was passed to me. Hey. 
I know this is a bit sudden, but would you like to go out with me? Saturday, 3 p.m. Killian. I took a peek at him and saw him smiling for the first time ever. Okay, I was about to write my answer when Jay snatched the note, read it, then stared straight at Killian. You, me, outside. What was he gonna do now? I sneakily followed them to the hallway, but Evelyn appeared right behind me and signaled me to shush. That was when I heard Jace asking what was going on between me and Killian. Nothing really. Only the infamous love locker foretold Karina and I would be together. Jace was too stunned to speak as he turned purple with rage. So there's nothing going on between you and Jace? Of course not! I've been trying to tell you that this whole time! You've heard everything? Sorry, I didn't mean to. So, what do you think? About the date? Um, sure. I'd love to. I could see Jace's spoiled over from behind, but what could he do other than bear his grudge and storm off? <laughs> Problem solved! Saturday arrived and Killian picked me up for our date. He even asked for my parents' approval, then opened the car door for me like a true gentleman. To be honest, I was kind of nervous, but he was so good at comforting me. He then took me to the super cool ice cream drive through And coincidentally, we picked the same flavor. Butter pecan. <laughs> Before I noticed, I'd felt so comfortable around him already. And you know what the best part was? Our last stop was a planetarium. We sat side by side beneath the glistening star-filled sky. Whoa. This date was much more than I expected. I got to see this whole new side of him. One that is so warm and caring. Being with him made me feel good. Maybe the algorithms weren't quite accurate, right? It did say Killian and I would never be a couple, but what I was feeling then proved otherwise. I was still lost in thoughts when my alarm suddenly went off. 5.15 already? Right, I gotta get to the locker and change the walkie-talkie's battery. So I quickly said goodbye to Killian, then ran to the alley. As I was opening the locker to get the walkie-talkie out... Karina? Are you... opening the locker? How? Unless you're... Oh... I don't know how, but you sure tricked the entire school. I froze on the spot not knowing what to do. There's no need to freak out. I'm not gonna tell a soul. That is, as long as you become a girlfriend. Why are you so obsessed with me? You can have anyone else you want. Why me? Cause you're different, babe. You're interesting and somehow aren't easily swayed by me. Which makes you a challenge. Ugh. This douchebag made me want to vomit. He could expose me all he wants, but I'd never ever go near him again. I shoved past him to leave, but suddenly, he grabbed my hand and tried to force me into his embrace. Get off of me, you psycho! I never meant for it to turn out like this. I just wanted to prove that data was the driving force of compatibility. But maybe I'd been wrong after all. <sighs> I decided it was time to confess all to Evelyn before Jace told her first. Only the next morning, when I arrived to pick her up as usual, her mom told me she'd already left. Hmm, was there something I didn't know about? I turned on my phone notifications, and that's when I saw it. Alicia had posted the picture of Jace grabbing me, but the angle made it look like, in Alicia's words, we were kissing. Huh? So that's why Evelyn didn't want to see me. And what would Killian think of this? I arrived at school just as Killian stepped out of his car. I rushed toward him and when our eyes met, I could see he was hurt. Then he just turned and walked away. Without thinking, I caught up with him and I poured my heart out telling him I was the one behind the locker. How I got involved with Chase because of Evelyn and how I lied to him when he went to the locker. But that was also how I realized I had feelings for someone. For you. Excuse me? You're the one behind the love locker? No way. Gosh, I'm so glad I got all my secrets out. In that case, we have a big problem. Evelyn then walked me along the corridor, and what I saw was pure chaos. 
people were crying, arguing, and even fighting, all because of the locker. One couple was having a tearful breakup because the locker claimed they weren't meant to be. In the other corner, two girls were fighting because the locker matched them to the same guy. A boy was breaking stuff out of anger since the locker didn't match him with his crush. The entire lobby echoed the words, Love Locker. Gosh, how'd I been so oblivious to this before? I'd been so caught up with my own problems, I'd neglected the consequences of the locker I'd created. This was wrong, so wrong. I had to shut the locker down right now. I rummaged through my bag to find my MacBook, but this was my baby, my first brainchild. I, no, I must do this. <sighs> yeah, that was the right thing to do. Technology shouldn't be used to predict one's feelings. I've learned the hard way not to mess with anyone's relationship ever again. And that love is never ever simple. You don't need a mysterious object of the spiritual world to tell you who to date. You just gotta experience it. Well, it's been three months since I shut down the infamous love locker. Now, everything is finally back to normal. And guess what? I've got a boyfriend. Yep, Kilian and I just went official last week. Evelyn doesn't like Jace anymore. She vowed not to run after some good-looking pretentious jerk ever again. Instead, she's just gonna wait for the right guy to come along. About the love locker, when people realized it didn't work anymore, the speculations became rife. My personal favorite is that the spirit had found peace and left. But still, every now and then, I hear someone gossip about the haunted love locker that once turned the whole school upside down, and I can help but feel all goose pimply. <sighs> I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, <laughs> it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero! Oh my gosh, you're amazing. I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, History is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last-minute studying. Come on! We all know you'll win anyway! You even said that yourself! So let's just hang out for a little, please? Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place! I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie! We have to try their croissants! All the food bloggers are talking about it! But this is Leafmore's territory! Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us! Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside! Oh well. It seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fists to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze. But they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school. Are you? Oh snap! Did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was gonna throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late. Have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? 
Oh my god! Evan, it's you! Mmm. Is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she definitely lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And we're still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever! I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me. This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right, I just gotta do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely gonna secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willowmere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, 
Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it. When suddenly a voice said, Let me see. I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him, when suddenly Miss Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Miss Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and gobbed on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But 
Well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, it began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. What a beautiful day! Guess who just landed the lead role in the musical club's next play? Yep, me! As I immersed myself in the rhythm of the music... Ouch! I bumped into someone and fell over. Are you blind? You think you're so special you can just waltz around the place as you please? Not again. Why do I keep running into her? That's Kiera, the mean girl from my musical club. I sing, she dances, I always make sure to stay in my lane, but for some reason, Kiera won't stop criticizing me. Ugh, please, you sound like a screeching cat. Give me fingernails on a chalkboard over your squawking any day. Why has she gotta be so mean? Huh? What's this? Oh, a wallet. Someone must have dropped it. But I'm the only person in this alley. There must be an ID card or something in it, right? So I opened the wallet to check it, but nope. No student card, no ID. Instead, there's just a strange photo and a bunch of VIP membership cards with the name Sophia on them. Ooh, these places are swanky. This person must be super wealthy. I gotta hand this into the cop station. But wait, isn't this... Oh my god, a ticket to see Franz Ferdinand tonight! I love that band! And it's for the VIP area. Hmm, even if I bring this to the cops now, they still won't be able to find the owner before the concert anyway. We shouldn't let such an awesome ticket go to waste, right? So, what if... I'll enjoy tonight's concert on this girl's behalf, then I'll hand the wallet to the cops later. Honest! Wow, this is the biggest stage I've ever seen in my life! I got to my seat and eagerly waited for the show to start when I heard a voice next to me. Hey, you must be Sophia. My gosh, this guy was gorgeous! But he'd mistaken me for someone else. Wait a minute. That's right, Sophia was the name on the cards, the wallet's owner. I was still looking for a way to explain this awkward situation when he continued, Glad to meet you. I'm Roman, and I've heard a lot about you from my parents. They're kind of good at arranging things, aren't they? Because I really admire this band. I should have foreseen this happening. I mean, who goes to a concert alone? Luckily for me, it appears that this Roman guy had never met the real Sophia before. For one night only, I could pretend to be her, right? And guess what? The guy was not only super cute, but also a talented musician. He'd spent most of his life in Italy and had not long returned to the US to attend college here. Through him, I learned that Sophia was a gifted singer, and both their parents set this meeting up so that Roman could help her singing career. Talking to Roman felt so natural, and soon I was singing and swaying to the music alongside him. As soon as I arrived home, I immediately went online to find more information about Roman. Wow! His SoundCloud account has over 200,000 subscribers! <sighs> Handsome and talented, he's like a James Dean of modern times. As I was daydreaming, my phone vibrated. He texted me. I had a great time tonight. I'm having a small welcome home party at the Madison Club. I heard you go there often. If you're not busy, would you like to join us? The Madison Club? As in, one of the most expensive country clubs in the state? The initiation fee alone costs a thousand dollars, and this girl is a frequent flyer? And, yup, here's the Madison Club VIP membership card. I know, I know. But I still had loads of music-related questions to ask Roman. Just this once. Then I would definitely hand it in. Now, on to the next problem. I couldn't wear these mediocre outfits to the Madison Club. 
I needed something demure, but expensive looking. Hmm, if I was Sophia, where would I shop? Yes, the Crystal Lane Mall. The next morning, I strolled up to the exclusive shopping mall with all of my savings. But how can a dress this short cost $5,000? Are there actually people who are willing to pay that much for this tiny fabric? The only item I could afford was a sparkly hairpin. So be it. I gritted my teeth, taking the hairpin to the checkout counter, along with all the cash I had on me and the membership card. But surprisingly, not only did I get the hairpin for free, but they also gifted me this cute bag. Apparently, it was my birthday. Well, Sophia's birthday, to be exact. Honestly, I felt kind of guilty enjoying these services in Sophia's name, but I didn't spend any of her money. Seeing as this bag's a freebie, I get to keep it, right? The next day, I settled on a simple but pretty dress and my beautiful new bag and wore them to school, as I planned to go straight from there to the party. When my best friend Anna came over to me, she took one look at my bag, then <gasps> gaped in disbelief. A Chanel bag? Did you sell a kidney to buy it? <laughs> it was a gift. Uh, where did you get that? That's a limited edition for VIP members of the Crystal Lane Mall only. Spill it. It's a fake, yeah? Kiera and her unruly friends were at it again. I tried to pull Anna away as I didn't want any trouble, but she still managed to clap back at them. It's 100% authentic. Maisie's rich boyfriend got it for her. Jealous much? Kiera sneered, then said unless I called my boyfriend over, she would tell the whole school that we were tragic liars. Come on, Maisie. Show them what humiliation feels like. Oh no. What should I do? Thanks to Anna's expectant looks and Kiera's smug grin, I had no choice but to ask Roman to pick me up after school. Um, he says he'll come get me after class. As soon as I stepped out of the school gate, I saw Roman waiting next to a shiny Bugatti Chiron. He greeted me with a smile, then opened the door for me. I didn't need to turn around to know that Kiera was watching me with fiery eyes. After this, she wouldn't dare to look down on me again, right? Ooh, this place was even more lavish than I imagined. As we were early, Roman invited me to sing a song while he played the piano. I started singing, and he too joined in to harmonize, and this moment felt just great. How cool was it seeing him all immersed in music? By the time we finished our performance, I realized a crowd had gathered around us, and they all burst into wild applause. An angelic voice and a genius musician. What a perfect couple. I turned to Roman and saw him smiling fondly at me. Wow, I knew my parents said you were good, but I had no idea you'd be that incredible. Feeling my face heating up, I quickly excused myself, then ran to the bathroom, well, once I could find it, to calm down. Yeah, so this was a confusing mess, but it didn't change the fact that my heart was still thudding like crazy. This experience was like daydreaming, but maybe I should tell him the truth before things went too far. I returned to see Roman talking with a girl. Seeing me coming, Roman waved me over and said, Here she is. Hey, Sophia. I've just been chatting with your little sister. Oh no, I was going to tell Roman the truth myself, but when the girl turned around and isn't that Kiera? So Kiera is my, I mean, Sophia's sister? Kiera seemed as surprised as I was as she made up an excuse and left. Huh, did she really just leave without making a scene? The next day, I turned up at school with the wallet and looked for Kiera, only I couldn't find her anywhere. When the last bell rang, I received a message from her that said, Meet me in the alley behind school. I nervously arrived at the rendezvous spot and saw Kiera waiting there. Here's your sister's wallet. Sorry I didn't return it sooner. But to my surprise, she didn't even take the wallet. Thief, you'll pay for that. What did she mean by that? Let me be clear, I didn't steal this. I just picked it up by accident. I was always going to hand it in. Then why did you use my sister's name and membership cards? I just, no more excuses, stealing is still stealing. If you don't want everyone, including Roman, to know that you're an identity thief, you'd better do what I say. You will sing for me to lip sync at the city's upcoming singing contest. Singing contest? But Kiera's a dancer, not a singer. Suddenly, a voice from behind startled me. Here you are, Sophia. I've been looking for you. I turned and saw Roman's happy, oh-so-cute face. 
He'd be so gutted when he found out that I'd lied to him from the start. Sensing my feelings, Kiera just smirked at me before she left. Remember our deal, sister? It turned out that Roman had just finished composing a new song that day and wanted me to record a demo for it at his studio. But this isn't right. I hesitated, then blurted out, Roman, actually, I'm not... Roman interrupted before I could finish my sentence and showed me the poster of an upcoming singing contest. Oh, it was the one Kiera mentioned earlier. You should give it a try. It's a good opportunity. I shook my head sadly, but I can't. Why? How can I tell Roman that I can't participate in the contest because I have to help Kiera lip sync? So, I just told him some baloney about having a family thing on that day. When I got home, I decided there's only one thing for it. I had to block Roman. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but I had to stop this web of lies now before they overtook my life. On the day of the singing contest, although I'd pre-recorded the song for Kiera, she still dragged me along with her. Hmm, that's odd. She didn't seem her usual brash self. Maybe the nerves had got to her? Then, midway through her performance, she misjudged a move and her mic clattered to the floor. As she was standing there dumbfounded, my voice continued to blast out. The whole room fell silent. Then slowly, the murmurs began to rise. Everyone pointed and commented on Kiera, and I heard the man sitting next to me muttering, She's brought more shame on our family. How could I tell anyone that's my daughter? Oh, so this is Kiera's father? And the woman sitting next to him, probably her mother, was also shaking her head in boredom. At that moment, a staff member approached them to say something, and I could see their faces turn pale before they rushed out of the auditorium. Seeing that, Kiera burst into tears, then rushed off the stage. Jeez, how can parents treat their child like that? Kiera may have been a mean girl, but she didn't deserve that. I was about to go check if she was okay when a hand pulled me back. It was Roman. Maisie, it's your turn. Right at that moment, the host of the show called me to the stage by my real name. Huh? What was going on? I turned to look at Roman, but grinning, he just wished me luck and handed me the mic. And the music started. It was the song that Roman and I had sung together. I took a deep breath to calm myself, then sang my heart out. When I ended the performance, all three judges stood up to applaud, and the audience cheered me on. Oh dear, am I dreaming? What is all this? Do you know who I really am? Yeah, of course. I figured that out ages ago. Turns out me not knowing where the restrooms were in the country club gave the game away. <laughs> so he did his research and found out that I wasn't actually Sophia. Only because he still wanted to see me, he pretended not to know so we could carry on like normal. He also accidentally witnessed Kiera making me sing for her performance, so he decided to register me. Talking about Kiera, I wanted to make sure she was okay. We searched around and found her sitting outside, sobbing. It's okay. There will be other competitions. I'm not upset about that. It's my sister. She's missing. Through tears, Kiera told us about how from a young age, her parents wanted her and her sister to pursue a career in music. However, Kiera found a love of dance, while Sophia excelled at singing making her favorable to their parents. Regardless of how many dance contests Kiera won, they always overlooked her talent. Then, when she excitedly told them that she'd bagged the lead dance role in the school play, they just went on about Sophia instead. So, feeling disheartened and jealous, Kiera threw away her sister's wallet, the one that I accidentally picked up that day. In this singing contest, Kiera wanted to win against her sister in front of their parents for once, so she got me into this whole lip-syncing plan of hers. But last night, Sophia found out about it, and they had an argument. Then, in anger, Kiera blurted out nasty things, such as how she longed for Sophia to vanish from her life. Only that morning, she woke up and found that her sister had actually gone. Until now, Sophia still hadn't even shown up at the auditorium when it's soon going to be her turn to perform. What if Sophia never comes back? I shouldn't have been so mean. Roman and I comforted Kiera. Then we went to find Sophia together. Kiera took us to Sophia's fave places, but she was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, I remembered the picture carefully inserted inside her wallet. This must be a special place for her. 
This is my family's old house. We used to live here when I was little. We rushed over there and found Sophia sitting idly in front of the house. The two of them ran into each other's arms and sobbed like two children. Through tears, they talked it all out. Turns out, while Kiera was jealous of her sister, Sophia didn't have it any better either. She has been pressured by their parents' expectations since forever, and she did always feel sorry for Kiera because of all the privileges she had. You know, you can't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. If singing is your passion, feel free to live it to the fullest. But if it's not, don't be afraid to pursue what makes you happy. I mean, you're actually a really awesome dancer. So, in the end, Sophia and Kiera made up. After a big fight with their parents, the two sisters were free to pursue their own passion. Kiera focused on dancing, while Sophia and her friends formed an indie band like she always wanted. As for me, well, I've learned a lesson that if you find a lost item, take it to the cop station immediately. Luckily for me, it hasn't turned out so bad. I helped two sisters find peace and even got myself this handsome, super talented musician. I'm standing in the middle of the room wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online, so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball, on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present, right when the host announces that it's time for… my first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh, Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. 
As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here, I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background. So from now on, we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow, just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time, he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the Masked Knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh... My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mum's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. 
After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again. So I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone. And I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude. But wait, it was 9 p.m. already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke, and the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jair's. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now! <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Cause I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said? Did that mean he's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase, give us back the business and what's rightfully ours, then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed, like father like sons, very smart, but still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance, so please. Be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor! Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when the cops smashed the door coming in and behind them was... Mom! Stop right there. How dare you do this to my daughter? Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then... Well, you know the rest. 
A lot has happened in three months. Mom finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mom with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my gray-eyed, masked night. So... Taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. It's almost the finish line. Just a little more. Come on, Bolt. We can make it. Yes, yes, we've done it again. So, as you can see, the winner was me, Matilda, along with my horse, the Heroic Bolt. This is our third win in a row already. Woohoo! It may only be a small hometown race with a modest prize, but it's still gonna go a long way in supporting my grandparents' farm. Now it's time for this guy to rest. Good boy, Bolt. You did amazing out there. A 16-hand stallion, healthy, glossy coat, and a well-mannered temperament. Jeez, the horse dealers even follow me home now? I took a handful of hay, spun around, and hurled it at him. Go away! I don't want your stinking money. Bolt is not for sale. Right at that moment, my grandpa appeared. Matilda, that is no way to speak to our guest of honor. I apologize for my granddaughter's behavior. She's a firecracker at times. Teenagers, you know? Anyway, it's dinner time. Please join us for a home-cooked meal right this way. Huh? Guest of honor? Who could he be? Oh my god. It turns out the man was none other than Mr. Allen, the chairman of All Stellar Inc. Corp., the annual sponsor of my family's farm. I turned beet red and apologized profusely for being so rude to him. No problem, kiddo. I like your spirit. I thought it'd be a good idea to check out the farm I'm sponsoring, and I stumbled upon the racing tournament. Oh boy, you sure can race, can't you, girl? Not many can handle a wet track at that speed. We have our reservations about her, skipping school and competing in such dangerous races. But Matilda's insistent that she was a part of this family, so it's her responsibility to help us, her only remaining relatives. Mr. Allen gave me this thoughtful look, then said, How about this? The annual sponsorship for your grandparents' farm stays the same, and on top of that, you can move in with me and have a proper education. Did I hear him right? I gasped. B but who will take care of my grandparents? Sweetie, we still have our health. We can run this place just fine. That's right, Maddie. Take your chance. Opportunities like this don't come twice. But what about Bolt? I can't go without him. Bring him along. I have a small horse farm where he can stay. You can help around the stables, and we can call it payment for your school fees, alright? Well, I guess that's settled then. Yay! One week later, Mr. Allen sent his driver to pick me up, and the new chapter of my life started from here. Wait, oh my god, this can't be it! Mr. Allen said it was a small horse farm, but this place, it's enormous! As soon as I stepped out of the car, a girl my age rushed over and hugged me. Matilda, you're finally here! I'm your new sister, Judy. I greeted her back with the widest smile. She seemed so sweet. She led me over to the front porch where Mr. Allen and a woman were waiting for me. It must be my new mom, but why was she giving me such a strange look? Before I could even introduce myself, she turned and walked into the house. Hmm, maybe she wasn't feeling very well? That evening, I dined on a lavish meal. We chatted lots and the Allens seemed fascinated by my childhood life at the farm. Especially Judy with her 10,000 questions. <laughs> Sis, so, um, is it true that you have never seen your parents? 
Yeah, my father passed away in an accident before I was born, and my mom also left me when I was an infant. On hearing that, Judy gently comforted me while Mr. Allen smiled and said, Now, besides your grandparents, you also have us, your second family. You got a sister, a new dad here, and also your caring mom. Right, darling? Mrs. Allen flinched and dropped her fork. I immediately leaned over to ask, Mom, are you okay? But to my surprise, she just yelled at me. Don't call me that. Feeling flustered, I stared down at my plate. Had I done something wrong? Over the following days, I tried my best to get closer to mom, but I was always met with coldness in return. One time, seeing Mrs. Allen was resting outside, I brought her an iced coffee. But as soon as she saw me coming over, she placed her hat over her face pretending to be asleep. On another occasion, I complimented her dress but she just stuttered at me, then walked away. I really wanted her to like me but it was useless, she clearly detested me. <sighs> But at least I still have Judy and dad by my side. Judy tried reassuring me that mom was a good person and that she just needed a little more time to get to know me better. As for dad, not only did he send me to a top school, but he also encouraged me to follow my passion. All the afternoons when I got to watch horse racing and bet on the winning horse with dad were so much fun. And as I watched the horses gallop past, a thought crossed my mind. What if Bolt and I were the one on that track? winning the race and bringing back the huge prize money for my grandparents. I couldn't stop thinking about this. So one time, on the way back home from a race, I asked my dad if I could compete. And he didn't even hesitate to reply. Why not? You do have a talent. How about give it a go? Oh god, this was so exciting! My foster dad was the best and I couldn't wait to give this my all and make him proud. After that, he immediately got me a personal coach and a dedicated team of trainers and groomers for Bolt. I'd never felt so happy, and Bolt had never looked so good. Everything was great, except that Mrs. Allen still seemed to have an issue with me. Every time I packed for practice, she always frowned and muttered stuff under her breath. Maybe she's irritated about the fact that an adopted child like me was receiving much more than I deserved, or something. But anyway, whether she liked it or not, with my talent, I'll quickly rise to be a brilliant rookie. One morning after practice, Judy came up to me and said, Matilda, can you teach me how to ride a horse? Uh, it might be a little scary for a first-timer. Are you sure you want to try? Yes, please. If I know how to ride, I can spend more time with Dad just like you do. I looked at her angelic, hopeful face. How could I say no? So I helped her onto Bolt and taught her how to hold the reins and do a few commands. It went smoothly at first, but suddenly Mrs. Ellen came out of nowhere and shouted, What are you doing? Judy, come down right now! Startled, Judy misjudged her movements and tumbled off Bolt. As we both rushed over to check on her, Mrs. Ellen pushed me aside, which caused me to fall onto my butt. Do you know how important legs are to a ballet dancer? Are you intent on ruining her future? Before I could reply, she shouted, What an incompetent kid! Get out of my sight! Ugh, it was just a few scratches and bruises. Why was she so serious about it? And incompetent? Huh, fine. I'd show her what an incompetent kid can do. From then on, I got my head in the game and continuously won several small and medium prizes. I sent most of my winnings to help out my grandparents and kept the rest to treat Judy and myself to something nice. One day after dinner, Dad called me into his office and told me that the two biggest races of the year, the Grand Shields and the Royal Silver Ford were coming up in two weeks and he'd already signed me and Bolt up for them. But the two races were only one week apart. That would be too much for Bolt, cause the latest race seemed to wear him out. I mentioned this to Dad, but he was adamant that Bolt would be able to manage it. I didn't want to let Dad down, but I didn't want to hurt Bolt either. I needed time to think about it. As I left the room, I gave a petrified jump. There, in front of me, was a stone-faced Mrs. Allen. She grabbed my arm and yanked me into another room. You can't compete in the races. They are different from your usual amateur events. You're not good enough, and you'll only embarrass our family. Were you eavesdropping on my conversation with Dad? Listen, you're not my mother, so you can't tell me what to do. I will surely join it. Then I stormed out of there.
Early in the morning of the first race, I was going to the stables to check on Bolt when it caught one, two of Mrs. Allen's servants sneaking out of there. Hmm, what were they doing here? I went to investigate and... Huh? This is not Bolt! What has Mrs. Allen done to my horse? Right at that moment, Mr. Allen walked in with the vet. I told him what I'd just seen and he muttered out, That woman dares to get in my way, huh? I'll make sure she'll pay for it this time. Then he turned to me and said, Leave it to me, I'll find Bolt. Go get some rest and prepare yourself for the race. I'd never seen him this stern before, so I just nodded in concern. Despite all the drama, I still managed to bring home the Grand Shields Championship title. It's amazing, right? However, I couldn't fully enjoy the victory as one thing was still lingering on my mind. Mrs. Allen has been absent for the last four days. Could it be that dad has done something to her? Hey, Judy, did Mrs. Allen say she was going somewhere? Dad told me that mom's been so stressed lately, so he arranged for her to go to Aunt Anna's villa to rest. Oh, it seemed like what dad said at that time was just an expression of anger. <sighs> at least I had one less thing to worry about. You see, my main concern at the moment is Bolt, as his health has clearly deteriorated since the previous race. The vet says he's doing fine, but through Bolt's heavy breathing, I know something isn't right. A week passed by and the day of the second tournament finally arrived. While the vet was checking on Bolt before the race, Dad suddenly pulled me outside. We must win today's match. I expect a lot from you. I had a bad feeling about this somehow, but I still nodded and assured him that I would do my best. The race was about to begin. Everything's in check. I'm ready for it. But wait, why does Judy look so flustered? Maddie, mom was not on a trip. The storage room. Dad locked her there because she found out what he was up to. He's doping Bolt. What is she talking about? Could it be that the vet who came in earlier was drugging Bolt then? But no way! If there's anyone wanting to harm me and Bolt, it's Mrs. Allen, not Dad! Listen, Mom only swapped Bolt the other time to protect you. Before I could shape what happened, I saw a burly man covering Judy's mouth and pulling her away. Then a voice whispered in my ear, Only one game left. Just keep your mouth shut and do it properly. If you lose, I can make things very uncomfortable for you and your grandparents. Got it? Now get on the horse. A chill ran down my spine. I felt like I was gonna vomit. How could the caring, kind man I called dad turn out to be such a fraud? The signal of the match rang out. Ugh, what should I do? I couldn't let that wicked man get what he wanted. So I closed my eyes and stayed put. What do you think you're playing at? Run! Run now! Mr. Allen went crazy and rushed over to me. But right at that moment, the organizer appeared and asked me to take Bolt for a health check. They led Bolt away and brought me and Mr. Allen to the office, where I was shocked to see a frantic-faced Mrs. Allen cuddling Judy. It turns out that Judy had freed her mom from the room Mr. Allen had locked her in. Then she'd come straight here and handed the organizers incriminating paperwork of her husband's corrupt doings. Mr. Allen glared at me and shouted, I had to raise you without any benefits just because of her. Now it's your turn to pay me back. Then he immediately charged at me. But Mrs. Allen quickly covered for me and pushed him away. And one of the race organizers restrained him. Don't you dare harm my daughter. Huh? Daughter? Mrs. Allen looked at me with tear-soaked eyes. Sweetie, please give me a chance to explain. I fidgeted the coffee cup in my hand and stared at the ground while Mrs. Allen told me her side of the story. Turns out she really is my biological mom. Could you believe that? After my dad passed away, in her vulnerable state, she fell for Mr. Allen's forced charm and fake words. But he soon showed his real face and heartlessly separated me and my mom after they married. That's why she could only secretly send money to our farm under Mr. Allen's name. Mom also recognized me from the beginning, but she didn't say anything as she knew that Mr. Allen adopted me just to get Bolt, a horse that could help him win some shady bettings. If I knew the truth and rebelled against him, he would harm me. I'm so sorry for all these years, especially these past few months. It has been extremely hard for me, having to treat my dear daughter so badly. 
but that was the only way to push you away from him, from this rotten house. I didn't want you to be in danger, just like how your real dad was when he worked for him. Please forgive me, Matilda. Tears kept rolling down my cheeks. Turned out, I always had a mother protecting me. Mom pulled me in for a tight hug. Mom! I hugged my mother tightly. I really love and miss you. Please forgive me. I looked up to her and smiled. Of course, yes. I'm more than happy to have you back in my life, Mom. And the best sister I could ever wish for, too. Hi, Mia here. Not to brag, but since childhood, I've always been kinda a genius. I've already stacked up over 20 science-based awards, and by adding this one more trophy into my collection, I even got to skip a grade. Your achievements at such a young age are admirable. What's your plan next? Well, I've decided to drop out of school. Yep, that's my plan. With as impressive of a profile, I'm just one research paper away from being accepted onto the Space Up Astronomical Research Program. Why waste time on boring classes, right? But ugh, mom and dad didn't like the idea of me not graduating. So after a lot of compromises, I did get to move to Quebec with my grandparents for a year. But I still had to go to school there. And voila, here I am in Canada, ready to conquer my dream. But why was there this angry crowd in front of my new home? They were screaming, cursing, vandalizing. My grandparents secretly signaled me inside the back way, then glumly told me how the crowd were parents of the children who got food poisoning after attending Riverside School summer camp. The problem was, the food was provided by my grandparents' farm, and now the school is threatening to file a lawsuit and doesn't seem to be open for negotiation. That can't be. There must be a solution for this. So gathering up my courage, I knocked on the principal's door. Do I know you? Um, I don't think so, ma'am. I'm Mia Jones, granddaughter of Mr. Peterson, the rancher. Wait, Mia Jones from New York? Hmm, come in. The woman must have been Mrs. Robinson, the principal's wife. But does she know me? As soon as we sat down, she said, I will withdraw the charges for you. Oh, ma'am, really? I knew we could sort this out amicably. Oh, but my sweet child, I don't do charity. I know what you're capable of, so I will only drop the lawsuit if you make my daughter the top student at school. In other words, you'll exchange all test results with her. What do you think? What do I think? I think that's a crazy proposition. But if I didn't do this, then the form would go under. So, with a reluctant nod, I agreed. Then I was immediately taken to meet her daughter. I was expecting someone snooty and spoiled, but to my surprise, this super smiley girl greeted me. Hey, I'm Eliana, but just call me Elle. I'm so sorry about my mom. She's got it into her head that I need to excel at school, since my dad is the principal. Elle hesitated for a bit, then continued. Also, there's Nora, the super smart daughter of my dad's ex. Mom doesn't want me to suck and dad to favor this other girl over me, so... Thinking about it, my main purpose for coming here was to complete my astronomical research. I don't need any more A. So, I smiled at Elle. Don't worry, I'll make sure you're the star student in no time. The next morning, I went to school with Elle, and wow, it looked so ancient and calm. Definitely distinctive from my stuffy school in New York. Elle introduced me to her friends and they all seemed really welcoming. It's gonna be great here. Still holding the deal, I helped Elle answer the teacher's questions, exchanged assignments and homework with her, and soon, Elle had already climbed up to the top rank. On the contrary, I was at the bottom of the class. Oh wow, Elle's mom really wasn't kidding when she said her grades were bad. But that didn't matter to me anyway. Cause the only thing I care about is this amazing astronomy tower. Talk about heaven! What are you doing here? I turned around to see Nora, the girl Elle had mentioned before, who is also the astronomy club's president. Hi, I'm Mia. I want to be part of your team. I have experience in studying astronomy and... Stop blabbering. Your grades suck and we have a strict no idiots allowed policy. I told Nora to at least give me a chance to prove myself, so she sat me down and sniggered as she handed me an astronomy test. Easy peasy, I got all the answers right in just 10 minutes. But instead of welcoming me into the club, she accused me of cheating. Ugh! Nora didn't just dislike me, she also seemed to despise L2. Any chance she got to call us out on something, she would definitely take it. Sir, they're cheating! I... I just want to help Mia. Please, I'm so sorry. Huh? Who was helping who? Mia, you've got a lot of nerve. 
Your test is suspended. The whole class was giving me disapproving looks. Being this disrespected by my peers was a new experience for me. How could Elle tell life so calmly? Great. Now that I was labeled a cheater, I would never get accepted into the astronomy club ever. Mia the cheater just had to find her way to get in there then. So, I waited until dark then sneaked into the janitor's room to steal the key to the observation tower. <sighs> now I could freely study my favorite constellation without any interruptions. Montreal is close to the North Pole, so the night sky here is so clear that I could see all the stars. At this rate, my research could be done faster than expected. Then I would be out of here, leaving all of these childish rivalry dramas behind. One night, I was busy taking notes when someone opened the door and walked in. Who's there? Oh no! I hastily grabbed my papers and escaped through the emergency exit door. Who is the guy? Why is he here at this hour? The next morning, I pushed my way through the noisy crowd and saw the announcement on the school spin board. The astronomy club warned outsiders not to use the observatory room and that there would be severe punishment once the recent trespasser was discovered. Shoot, the guy from last night must have snitched on me. Turned out, the snitch was Brandon, the new transfer student, and also the grandson of the founder of Space Up. It's a shame the incredible Sir Edward Foster's grandson was such a smug jerk. But that didn't stop all the girls from going cuckoo crazy for this Brandon guy. The ironic thing is, he kept on coming over to me and talking about astronomy. Huh? Doesn't everyone here see me as an insignificant kid? Is this yours? Brandon said while holding out a piece of paper. Oh my, this was part of my astronomy research. Did I drop it in the tower that night? But how did Brandon know it was mine? Flustered, I quickly made an excuse and left. I couldn't stop worrying about Brandon finding out I was the one who used the observatory room. If anyone knows about it, it'd be an instant suspension. I was busy thinking when suddenly the whole class burst into applause. As it turned out, they were praising my excellent essay on constellations. Well, it's known as Elle's essay now. Then the teacher turned to read the class's worst essay. My favorite star is Justin Bieber. Every time I see him, I think if only he was my husband. Everyone started laughing. <sighs> no prize for guessing whose name was on this one. Mia, I suggest you learn something from your friend Al. I turned to look at Elle and saw her smug face. She even joined in with the others to make fun of me. Was she really that stupid to write that essay? Or did she intend to embarrass me? When I got home, Elle was already waiting on the porch to apologize to me. I helped you as promised. Shouldn't your mom keep her promise too? Get the lawsuit dismissed now. Then I'll help you finish your final exam successfully. Else, I'm not doing it. She's on it, Mia. Don't worry. I know you're leaving after a year anyway. And I also know that you're the one who snuck into the observatory. So, if you want to leave peacefully, at least help me and Brandon to get together. You and Brandon? But what does it have to do with me? Elle then told me that Brandon was so impressed by her astronomy essay that he asked her out to discuss it further. But of course, she knew nothing about it, so she had a plan. I'll have my AirPod on, and you gotta stay on the line with me throughout the date so you could tell me the answers to his questions. If we become official, I'll buy you that telescope you bang on about so much. You know, that thingy-majiggy. Celestron! Celestron Telescope! Oh man, she really knew my weak spot. Alright then, we have a deal. That weekend, Elle and Brandon went for a walk in Jerry Park while I stayed at home eavesdropping on their conversation through the phone. I see you have a passion for the Astros, so why didn't you join the astronomy club? Just cause I'm busy with my studies, and I also have piano practice, you know. Really? Oh, in the paper, you mentioned the black hole Sagittarius A. You seem to have done a lot of research about it. Could you tell me more? Although Elle seemed frantic having me put words in her mouth, everything went pretty smoothly. Only one thing. The more Brandon and I talked, the more I realized we had so much in common. Even if it was through Elle, I still felt a connection with him. I thought everything was going well between them, but no. One day, Elle came to me in a fit of anger and said Brandon had turned down her love confession. I want you to go talk to him and figure out why. I need to know the reason. What? Why don't you just ask him? Because I'm me, Eliana Robinson. I don't ask such embarrassing questions. So I was the one who had to make the embarrassing move? Also, call me. I want to hear it myself. Gosh, this bossy girl. 
And so I had to drag Brandon to the quiet rooftop while my phone was secretly on a call with Elle so she could follow the conversation. Okay, let's get straight to the point. Why did you reject Elle? Um, because I like someone else? If you already like someone else, then why hang out with her? Because only when I go out with Elle, I can talk to the person I like. It's disappointing though, why don't you recognize me? I quickly ended the call hoping Elle didn't understand what was going on. He already knew I was behind Elle's words all this time? It turned out Brandon had met me once in the city's ranking contest for students in 6th grade, in which I surpassed him and won the first prize. He'd never met a kid smarter than him in astronomy before, so when he saw me again at school, he instantly recognized me. Only, he couldn't understand why my score was so low. Brandon wanted to talk to me, but he said that all he received was a cold shoulder. I felt a bit guilty, but it's all because he told the school administration I snuck into the astronomy room. But it turned out Nora was the one who reported me. Nora was there at the time too. By the way, why do you have to do Elle's homework? I told Brandon about my contract with Mrs. Robinson and apologized for not thinking about his feelings when I agreed to be behind his and Elle's date. I see. Follow me. There's something you should know. Brandon took me to see Nora. She didn't welcome me at first, but when Brandon told her about my secret, Nora immediately changed her attitude. I should've known. Someone like Elle couldn't make such progress. She and her mom are deceiving everyone again. Then, Nora told me how she was secretly investigating the food poisoning case because, on the day of summer camp, she saw Mrs. Robinson and Elle doing something shady in the school kitchen. Why should I trust you? Elle told me that you have it in for her. So maybe you're just trying to ruin her life. <laughs> Please, why do I have to do that? Believe it or not, your precious best friend is trying to embarrass you in front of the whole school. What is this? In the lecture hall, Elle was sitting in front of a screen which said, Mia's grandpa poisoned us? We rushed to the lecture hall to find her there, telling people that my grandparents were the ones that catered spoiled food, and that I had no shame copying her works, cheating many times, and even stealing Brandon from her while they were dating. So she must have figured out that Brandon liked me, huh? Even so, why didn't she talk to me directly? How dare she make things up about me and my family? Before I could do anything, Brandon changed what was on the screen to a video of me winning the Young Minds Intelligence Contest. Everybody started buzzing when they recognized who I was. Someone even spoke loudly. I watched that show! Is that really Mia? Elle's face turned pale as people started doubting her. Then Nora snatched the mic from Elle's hand and said, So, now we've made it clear that Mia isn't dumb at all. Then what about the poisoning at the camp? Did anyone find it strange how only Elle and her mother showed no sign of poison symptoms that day? That's cause they were the ones who poisoned the food and blamed it on Mia's grandparents. The screen continued to show a clip of Elle's mom looking shady as she spoke to some man. She did all that just to ruin Mia's grandparents' good reputation. Then she would hire this man to buy the farm on her behalf for a ridiculously low price. What did you say? Oh my god, the principal has been standing at the door and witnessed everything. Everyone, out! When there were only four of us left in the room, Elle furiously shouted, How dare you! You're just the outcome of your cheater mom, remember? Don't play dumb with me. You're well aware that my mom didn't cheat on Mr. Robinson, and that your mom is the one who lied to him to ruin his and my mom's wedding. And then what? Lying again that you're his daughter to force him to stay with her? You and your mom are awful people. Mr. Robinson stood in between them and stopped the argument. Oh, he didn't look too well either. Turns out, he already knew Nora's mom was wrongfully framed and didn't cheat on him at all. And that's why he always tried to make it up to Nora. But learning that Elle wasn't his daughter was one big bombshell. After knowing what his wife and daughter did, he decided to resign. He made amends with Nora's mom and they're giving it another go. After the truth came out, Elle and her mom left without a trace. I say, good riddance to bad news. My grandparents were cleared of the food poisoning allegations and now their business is booming again. With Brandon and Nora's help, I collected enough data and finished my assignment with flying colors. Now to quit high school and pursue my dreams. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just going on a short trip to Mont Megantic National Park to see the Northern Lights with Brandon and Nora. I've decided to stay and finish high school here so I can continue pursuing my passion for astronomy with my two soulmates by my side. 
I was rushing to finish homework when suddenly a screeching shout startled me. Julia, why did you hide the letter Ben sent me? <laughs> what? You've lost your mind, Katie. I already gave it to you. And didn't you say this guy was too ordinary for you? Why are you such a liar? This Ben guy tried calming her down, but it was too late. Everyone around us was already whispering. Ugh, I was not to blame for this. Guess what? That girl putting on the poor me act is my sister, Katie. We once were really close, but suddenly, boom, she changed. Now all she does is pick a fight with me. Oh, thank God. Here are my people. My dance club friends. Only dancing could help liven up my mood right now. We were happily chatting on the way to practice when suddenly... Julia, where are you going? Get back to class right now. Finals week is coming. <laughs> no way. You don't know how Katie just embarrassed me in front of the whole class. I'll never go back there. Stop making excuses. Then he dragged me back to the classroom. That's Max, my overbearing older brother. His catchphrases include, Julia, where are you going? Remember to come back before 9pm. You still have lots of homework to do. Or, Julia, come back and change your clothes. The dress you're wearing is too short. You see, I'm 16, not 6. Why does he keep treating me like a child? Worse still, this semester, he decided to move to my school to be able to watch my every step or something. Ugh, it's unbearable! After school, I came home exhausted, but unfortunately, this awful day was not over yet. Dad was there waiting for me, my report card in hand. Julia, there's not even a single B on here. Those dumb equations just wouldn't stick to my head. Dad, I've tried. Tried, you say? So it has nothing to do with you skipping school to go dancing, huh? Oh no, in her hand were a bunch of pictures of me practicing. Okay then, it's about time I let my parents know about my passion anyway. I think I want to pursue something else, which is dan- No, Julia, studying is the only way. I don't care what you do, as long as your grades improve. Please learn from your brother and sister. Study, 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 study all the time! I angrily stormed upstairs and slammed shut my door. Then I heard my mom's voice whispering outside. Never mention dancing again, Julia. Give it up. That silly hobby won't do you any good. What does she know? She isn't even my actual mom. Yes, they're just mine and Max's adoptive parents. I bet if my actual mom and dad were still alive, they'd understand and not forbid me from following my dreams. But life is too cruel. As our parents died 10 years ago in a traffic accident, then Max and I were in an orphanage until we were adopted and came to live here with our adoptive parents, a biology professor, a housewife, and their daughter, Katie. After a restless night of overthinking, the next morning, I trudged through the schoolyard like a zombie. Suddenly, a tall figure crashed into me. Ouch! The guy apologized profusely. Then, he told me he hadn't been paying attention as he was too engrossed in a cool video. Oh, this is our club's dance video I posted yesterday. We immediately started chatting. So, his name is Daniel. He's a new transfer student here but already a big fan of our club. We were watching another video together when his phone screen popped up a message. <gasps> hey, are you free tomorrow night? Katie? Oh, that's definitely my sister Katie. Why does she have to appear everywhere? Anyway, after I parted ways with Daniel, I excitedly ran to the practice room to tell my friends about our new hardcore fan. I waved at them, but they just ignored me. Weird. Hey guys, what's wrong? Don't you know? Julia, yesterday your mom called everyone asking to disband the club. Your mom even blamed me for being a bad influence and distracting you from studying. So please, stay away from us from now on. What? My mom said that? How did she even know their numbers? You're welcome, Pumpkin. I've helped you introduce your dear friends to mom. They seem to get along really well, don't they? Katie? Again? Why am I even surprised? I stumped after her. Then from afar, I spotted Daniel waving at her as they passed by each other. And she immediately turned on her flirty mode. Hmm, I suddenly thought of a great idea. Well, well, just wait and see, my beloved sister. <laughs> When Katie walked off, I quickly ran over to chat with Daniel, and it didn't take long for me to lure him into my trap. My friends are all going on about the new Jurassic World movie. Have you seen it? I want to watch it too, but I have no one to go with. Is that so? Actually, I was planning on seeing that movie this weekend. Let's go together. Bingo! The fish has taken the bait. Katie, you took away the one thing I love the most, and now watch me do the same to you. That Saturday night, I happily went to the cinema in a pretty dress. No sign of Daniel yet, so I got to my seat first. But 
Julia, what on earth are you doing here? Oh, Katie, the prey even showed up by herself. Nice. She immediately jumped on me, accusing me of stalking and ruining her date. We argued loudly until a member of staff kicked us out. A few days later, Daniel and I met at a cafe he chose. But right away, I saw Katie at the next table. Again, she seemed to be waiting for someone. I walked over to her. You're so persistent on being a third wheel. She was so angry but couldn't say anything. I went back to the table and sat with Daniel. Huh? What? There's ketchup all over my dress! Mmm, that does it! So I lunged at her and started brawling. And here we are, at the cop station, waiting to be bailed out. As soon as mom arrived, Katie put on her waterwork tack and sobbed about how I was trying to steal away the love of her life. I couldn't be around either of them anymore, so I left with Daniel. We weren't far from the cop station when Max rushed out from nowhere. Stay away from my sister, and why would I? Then my brother punched Daniel in the face. What are you doing? It's Katie. She's the one who keeps messing with us. No, Julia. Katie is just a victim. Stop seeing this guy. Great. Now even Max was defending Katie. I helped Daniel up and left with him despite Max's calls from behind. The next day, I was putting things in my locker when I saw Max and Katie passing by, looking real close. They were whispering something to each other, as if his real sister was her, not me. Fine then, if that meant I would stop being supervised. Katie still wouldn't leave me alone though. There were countless times she squeezed between me and Daniel, laughing with him as if I didn't exist. Another time, when we were about to kiss, she jumped out of nowhere, gave Daniel a concert ticket, then the two of them left together. So annoying. Honestly, it's no longer about taking revenge on Katie anymore. I do feel happy when I'm with Daniel. He seemed to want to be with me too, but why didn't he just reject Katie? But at least it was me he invited to the prom this Friday. Not her. That night, I excitedly put on my prom dress, curled my hair, did my nails. Everything's all set. Daniel would be here soon. I opened the door to go downstairs when, oh no, it had been locked from outside. My parents were on vacation, so it had to be my cruel siblings. I immediately called my parents, but all I received was, You shouldn't be even thinking about prom, considering how bad your grades have been lately. Stay home and study. Right at that moment, there was the sound of an engine outside. I ran to the window and saw Katie getting into Daniel's car. I banged on the door and yelled, but only Max's voice came from outside. Julia, that guy is not good at all. Just leave this to me and Katie. Why are you on her side and not mine? Why is everyone turning their back on me? I felt like such an outsider in this family, so from then on, I did my best to ignore them all. I passed without a word as Max and Katie gathered around our parents after their trip. Then I stayed silently in my room, ignoring Max's call outside the door. I also tried ignoring Daniel, but he continued calling me. I think you've got the wrong number. I'm not Katie. Huh? Julia, what's wrong with you? Um, let's see. You left me alone and went to prom with Katie? Oh, that... I already saw Katie waiting as I arrived. She said you'd already left for prom with your friends. I looked for you everywhere. I was thinking about you the whole party. Gosh, Katie is taking things too far. Even my poor Daniel has to put up with her stupid tricks. Baby, what should I do to make you feel better? How about a road trip? Let's spend this weekend together, just us two. Honestly, all I need is Daniel's sweet voice to make my anger go away. I'd love that. I'm so sick and tired of being in this nightmare house. Being alone with Daniel felt amazing. After two hours of driving, we pulled up at a gas station to take a break, and he told me to pick anything I wanted. This trip is on me. I have to make it up for my princess, don't I? Oh, how did I get such a wonderful boyfriend? I stuffed my face with snacks as I waited for Daniel to return from the restroom. Hmm, what's taking him so long? Just as I was going to step outside to look for him, the cashier stopped me. I'm sorry, miss. You haven't paid for those. Also, your friend left you this. Then he gave me a bunch of papers. One of them was a note saying, Surprise! Take this as your first life lesson, honey. Don't be so gullible. If you're wondering why you deserve all this, go ask your lovely brother, Max. Dan. I stared down at the other papers. Receipts! This came to hundreds. He'd grab all these random things, including five boxes of Mountain Dew. Is this for real? How could this guy be the guy I was deeply in love with just seconds ago? I was on the verge of breaking down. 
But first, I still had this huge bill to pay. Oh god, where do I get the money for all this? Should I call my family for help? No, no way. I could already hear Max scolding, then my parents nagging, and Katie's scornful look. And so, I begged the store owner to let me work here to pay back the bill. It's not so bad, at least I wouldn't have to go home. But only, I kept on messing up. I clogged the slushy machine so the floor was covered in sugared ice, I knocked over the sunglasses stand while cleaning, and constantly counted change incorrectly. It was a disaster. Maybe if I'd pay more attention in math, it wouldn't be this bad. I tried everything but all I did was create more trouble instead of paying back the money. Eventually, they kicked me out. And now all I can do is sit at this abandoned bus stop, not knowing where to go or who to find. Thinking about my life with my family before made me tear up. If only, suddenly, a familiar car stopped in front of me. Dad! Julia, here you are. Everyone's been frantically searching for you. I'm so glad you're okay. Why did you scare us like this? I'm sorry, Dad. Dancing is my only passion, but I knew you wouldn't accept it. No, Julia. I'd never stop you pursuing what you love. I used to think you were just making up excuses for being lazy. Right at that moment, another car pulled over. It was Max, my mom, and even Katie. What on earth are you doing? If you keep acting like this, mom and dad will kick us out. Max, why would you think such a thing? Max let go of me, then hesitantly said, I know you take education very seriously, so I always try my best at school. Julia and I are just adopted, so... Actually, I'm adopted too. I've overheard this once from mom and dad. So ever since then, I was scared they'd love Julia more than me and throw me out. Oh my baby, it's true. We adopted all three of you. This doesn't change a thing. You're our children and we love you all. And only wish for you to care and look out for each other. Whoa, this was all too much to take in. My emotions were all over the place and I didn't know whether to smile or cry. Secrets only make us misunderstand one another, so from now on, we won't hide anything, okay? On that note, I'm sorry, honey. Let me tell you all this one last secret that I've been keeping to myself all these years. It turned out that my adoptive mom was mine and Max's biological dad's ex. After our parents died, she offered to take us in. Our adoptive dad didn't know the story behind that, and he only knew about an ex of my adoptive mom who was a pro dancer. Mom was so afraid dad would find out about me and my brother's true identity and be angry, so she tried her best to hide my dance talent. But she never expected her husband to be this generous and understanding. So all problems were resolved and family peace was restored. Oh boy, I miss home so much. But now is not the time to go back. Us three siblings had one more important task. Expose Daniel. Can you believe that Daniel turned out to be my brother's best friend from his old school? Daniel misunderstood my brother's friendship for love, so when Max rejected him, he felt like a fool and started causing problems for Max. That's why Max transferred schools, but Daniel followed him there. Knowing Max loved his two sisters very much, he deliberately approached us both and played tricks to make us resent each other. After that time at the police station, Max told Katie about this and worked up a plan to expose Daniel. We found Daniel's current partner and invited him to meet them at a diner. Then we told him everything his boyfriend had done. Needless to say, he was so angry, he finished with Daniel and exposed his true face to the whole school. Facing a barrage of criticism, Daniel was scared and apologized to the three of us and promised to make up for it. Well, now that I have a happy family, I can freely pursue my dance passion. What else do I need? Just looking at Daniel being subservient is enough to satisfy me. <laughs> I've made it! I'm on the paradise island of Koh Lanta and I actually get to stay here at this luxurious beachside resort. Hey, I'm Achara, a 17-year-old girl from Krabby Town, Thailand. As amazing as this place is, I'm actually not here on vacation. Instead. I'm here to reunite with the boy I saved 10 years ago. I almost forgot he existed until last week when I came across a Facebook post by Thomas, a famous British swimmer, searching for the mystery girl who saved his life as a child. Thomas is currently in Thailand for business. So here I am, eager to finally see him again. I was waiting by the gate when suddenly sounds of rolling suitcases came from behind me. I turned around to see two girls about my age standing there. Hmm. Who are they? Before I could say anything, the gate opened and a friendly woman invited us inside. According to Mrs. Danvish, Thomas's housekeeper, 
He had a training schedule in another city and wouldn't be back for a couple of days. Then she introduced us to each other. The short-haired girl is called Sarai, and the longer-haired girl is Kanda. Deary me, I must say that having three girls all claiming to be Thomas's savior came as a bit of a surprise. <laughs> but I'm sure the truth will come out in the wash. Until then, please all stay here and make yourselves comfortable. So, those two girls are pretending to be me? Unbelievable! But, no problem. Thomas would soon realize I was the one he was looking for and would kick those imposters out of here. I dropped my suitcase off in my room, then went downstairs for dinner. As soon as I sat down, Sarai spoke up. <clears throat> Stop acting. I know you two fakers are just pretending to be me so you can get your hands on Thomas's fortune. <laughs> You're the fake one. Curly hair and a mole. You really have done your study, huh? OMG, these two audacious girls were getting on my nerves. At that moment, Mrs. Danvish entered, followed by the waiter with a trolley full of the most delicious looking food I'd ever laid eyes on. Now that Mrs. Danvish was here, the two imposters immediately changed their frosty attitudes to their bright smiles and sweet as pie acts. <sighs> Ladies, please help yourselves to food and drink. Then tomorrow morning, after you've all been well rested, we shall have a little chat. Um, but how am I supposed to enjoy the food when I have these two vultures glaring at me? I quickly finished my meal, then rushed back to my room. I must be well prepared for tomorrow. The next morning, a maid escorted me out to the garden for breakfast. The other two girls were already there. On seeing me, Kanda scowled at me, while Sarai made a point of sawing her knife through her omelet. I was about to help myself to some breakfast, when suddenly Mrs. Danvish appeared and said, Morning, girls. I hope you're all well rested. She sat down, then continued. Now to the main point. I'm rather curious and was wondering where you first met Thomas. Easy. It was here on this island when I was 10 years old. I was collecting shells on the beach when I met him. Busted. I was only seven years old then, imposter. Gee, a careless move over there, Conda. Thomas clearly specified in an interview that he'd been eight years old and the girl who saved him was a year younger. Yes, I met Thomas when I was seven years old. At that time, my father was a helmsman. I often followed him here, and once I spotted Thomas sitting alone on the beach. Feeling bored waiting for my dad, I came to say hi and hang out with them the whole day. That afternoon, Thomas got a cramp while swimming and he would have drowned if it wasn't for me. I saved him, then my father and I took him to the hospital. Mrs. Danvish just listened silently, and when all three of us had finished answering, she said, Indeed, the girl in question was seven at the time. So, Conda. No, I just misremembered. See, I was only seven at the time. I could easily get confused. Mrs. Danvish didn't say anything more after this, but I saw this knowing look in her eyes. Then, that night at dinner, there were only two places at the table set, and Conda never made an appearance. Seems like things are getting serious. The next morning, I was making the most of my time here by lounging around on the beach, reading my favorite book, when someone blocked out the sun. I looked up to see Sarai smirking down at me. Enjoy yourself while you can, as you'll be the next to leave. As if! You may have memorized all the information from the newspapers, but that's not going to be enough to fool Thomas. You. I saw the fury in Sarai's eyes as she raised her hand to slap me. But, huh? Someone stopped her. Standing in front of me was a tall, handsome guy. Wow, who is he? Miss, violence is not the answer. <laughs> who are you to lecture me? Actually, I'm Eli, Thomas's assistant. Sarai tutted under her breath and then strutted off. Um, are you okay? I'm fine. I just don't know how someone has the nerve to lie like that. We continued talking as we strolled along the beach. Eli mentioned how I was exactly as Thomas had described me. Seeing as Eli seemed to be on my side, I took the chance to ask him more about Thomas, such as what his favorite foods, colors, and movies were. Yesterday I spoke to Thomas's housekeeper, Mrs. Danvish. She seems to know a lot about him, doesn't she? That's right. She was Thomas's nanny. Due to their busy schedules, Thomas's parents were often busy, so most of the time Mrs. Danvish was the one taking care of him. He's very fond of her. Then Eli showed me a picture of Mrs. Danvish hugging a smiley, young-looking Thomas. Oh, so he had blonde hair when he was little? I was so lost in thought, I didn't notice a rock and tripped over it. Eli immediately reached out to study me. Then he asked if I was okay. 
Oh my god, what happened to me? Why is my heart thudding like crazy? That night, Sarai and I were sitting in the dining room having a stare off as we waited for dinner, when suddenly a man walked in holding two bouquets of sunflowers. Thomas! Oh wow, he looks even more handsome in real life. My best friend Dara should have been here to see this. I told her to come here, but she wouldn't listen to me. Before I had time to greet Thomas, Sarai rushed over and hugged him. Then she pretended to get all emotional. Finally, we're reunited. Not a day has passed when I haven't thought of you. Thomas awkwardly pushed her away, then scratched his head. Let's have dinner first and then talk about this later. The food looked delicious as always, but I had a job to do. Only, whenever I tried to say something to Thomas, that awful Sarai interrupted me. Since our first meeting, the image of a cute, brown-haired boy has been imprinted on my heart. I noticed Thomas pause and exchange a knowing look with Eli. You mean blonde, right? She thinks you had brown hair because she's never seen you when you were a kid. And that just proves she's a fraud. Thomas looked at me, stunned, then turned to Sarai in disappointment as she blurted out, It's not like that. Please hear me out. Without letting Sarai finish her sentence, Thomas sternly said, You know, I can totally sue you for impersonation and fraud. If you don't want to get in trouble, get out of here at once. Sarai looked like she was about to cry as she stuttered helplessly, then quickly got up and left. Thomas then grabbed my hand, smiled, and said, Finally, I found you. So he's weeded out the frauds. But why do I feel so guilty when I see his cheerful face? And what about Eli? Why do I find myself wishing it wasn't Thomas holding my hand right now? <sighs> the next morning, I took Thomas to my hometown and showed him around. We were walking along the shore of the Krabby River when I saw Dara waiting. There she is. I invited her to join us. This is Dara, my best friend. Dara, this is Thomas, the guy I was talking to you about. Right then, my phone started ringing. Excuse me, I've got to take this. Go ahead, guys. I'll be right back. I quickly left, but did not forget to wink at Dara and whisper to her. I did my best. Now it's your turn. I took a stroll around the area and came back to see Thomas sitting alone, looking off into the distance. Hmm, where did Dara go? Seeing me, he stood up and said, Dora had something to do, so she left early. We should leave, too. On our way back home, I couldn't help but ask Thomas, So, Dora told you everything, right? What do you mean? Oh, well, she did tell me about some interesting sports in the town. Oh, man, that means Thomas still has no clue? Silly Dora, I put so much effort into bringing him here. Oh, hey, Achara. This suddenly came to my mind. When you took me to the hospital back then, do you remember what flower you gave me? Flowers. Hmm. He got me sunflowers last time, so it must be... Of course I remember. I gave you a sunflower. I wanted to cheer you up. I was expecting a nod from Thomas, but to my surprise, he sighed and said, Actually, I just made that up. There were no flowers at all. Thomas's words got me wavered. I didn't want to end up in a position like this. Fine. If Dara chickened out of telling him the truth herself, then I guess I just have to do it. Thomas, I'm... I'm sorry. Actually... And so, I told Thomas the truth. The one who saved Thomas that day was Dara, not me. And she's in a pretty tough situation right now. Ever since her dad's accident that left him unable to take his boat out anymore, Dara's family were in terrible debt. So... When I saw the article where Thomas was searching for his savior, I tried to convince Dara to come forward, as he might be able to help out her family. But I can't do that. I can't let him see me in this awful state. He would presume I was only after his money. No matter how much I tried to convince her, Dara still refused to go and meet Thomas. And so I decided to disguise myself as Dara and approach you first. Then I planned to reunite you here. And she agreed to all that? No, she didn't. I carried things out all alone. I kept asking Dara for more information about the past and then spent all my savings on hair appointments and makeup to fake a mole like hers. Then I lied to my parents that I was participating in a summer camp and went to Colanta. I also arranged to meet her here today, but I guess she's still not ready to talk to you. Actually, when I saw Dara, I felt this strange connection toward her, but seeing the way she left like that, 
Maybe she doesn't want to see me again. Oh no, what had I done? I want to bring them together, not drive them apart. Are things really just going to end up like this? It's been three days since then, and now here I am, nervously waiting for Dara in the airport lobby. I'd asked her to meet me here, but this doesn't look good. Does she really not even bother to say goodbye to me before I leave the country? Achora, seems like Dara isn't coming. I'm sorry, but we have to go. I gave a solemn sigh and pulled my suitcase, when suddenly I heard someone call, Wait up! Achara! I turned around and saw Dara running towards me. Oh boy, what a relief! I quickly hid away my smile and put on a sulky expression. Oh, you're here? Thought you wouldn't come. Anyway, my boyfriend and I are off to London to meet his family. They're really eager to meet his savior, right babe? Thank you for coming to send me off! Dara gave an awkward look, then she took my hand and led me over so she could whisper. Achara, can I talk to Thomas in private for a minute? Yes! My plan worked! I turned to Eli and gave a thumbs up, then we rushed off and left Dara and Thomas to talk alone. <laughs> Did you really think I would let those two idiots give up on each other so easily? No way! I had discussed it with Thomas and planned to fake a cheesy farewell at the airport, and voila! Dara finally realized her feelings for Thomas in this hit or miss moment, and the two of them had a happy reunion. Yay! So, what about me, huh? Well, you don't have to worry, because I might have scored this cute, handsome assistant right here. <laughs>